Um, the next session, session three, our third session of the day, is chaired by Professor Raven Garvey. Raven is associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and curator of um, circumpolar and Western North American archaeology in UMA. And uh, the session is Dual Inheritance and Quantitative Modeling, Cultural Evolution Evolves. Turn it over to Raven. Thank you, Rob. I'm also going to bring this down a bit. Um, so um, I hadn't intended to say this, but just having um, been present during the last session, I, I just want to start by saying I was really quite affected by the previous session and recognized that the session we're about to begin might feel to some a bit like a cold turn away from the very intimately human element at the center of Tiffany's session. And, and I just want to acknowledge that and also my appreciation of the previous session. And my appreciation, too, um, of the diversity of perspectives and research foci re represented among the University of Michigan faculty, students, and alumni, it's one of the things that makes this such an amazing place to be. Um, and I'll say, too, that while this next session, this, the one we're about to begin, centers on evolution, the approaches described here are, to my mind, representative of attempts to get away from progressivism, even as we discuss uh, the deeper past in evolutionary terms. And so with that, I'll turn back to the notes I originally prepared um, to, to begin our session. So um, hello and welcome to session three of this international conference celebrating Michigan's mark, past, present, and future. The session, as Rob mentioned, is titled Dual Inheritance and Quantitative Modeling, the Cultural Evolution Evolves. So as many of you know, Michigan was a very early center of cultural neo-evolutionary thought, beginning with the work of Leslie White, who is credited with establishing, or I guess re-establishing, cultural evolution as a central focus in anthropological scholarship. And in 1959, 100 years after uh, the origin of species, it was White who famously described culture as human's extrasomatic means of environmental adaptation, or an adaptation apart from our biological selves. So where cobras have uh, deadly venom and cheetahs are fleet of foot, we humans have all sorts of manufactured tools and managed institutions that help us capture food and defend ourselves and ultimately uh, impact virtually every aspect of our planet's surface and near-Earth atmosphere sphere and beyond. So I guess I'm sort of foreshadowing some of the some of the talks to come and maybe getting a little bit carried away with that. Um, but anyway, Leslie White, um, White's notion of extrasomatic adaptation was, and in many ways still is, a guiding theme in processual archaeology. And processual archaeology, as many of you also know, is a school of thought that arguably also started here at Michigan, or at least is certainly a paradigm strongly associated with members of the Michigan archaeological community. Cultural evolutionism is a theoretical framework at the heart of processual archaeology, and many processual research agendas are motivated by a desire to explain culture in terms of environmental adaptation, particularly in the context of environmental change. The approaches to cultural evolution represented in this session build in important ways on processual definitions of cultural evolution, while also drawing in new theories and methods, um, some of which were first developed in the field of evolutionary biology. And many of these new theories and methods were part of what's referred to uh, in, in evolutionary biology as the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis, or EES. One of our speakers in this session, Dr. Melinda Zeter, will be discuss discussing the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis in some detail. But just to introduce the basic idea, which may be unfamiliar to some in this room, the EES, or Extended Evolutionary Synthesis, is a set of theoretical concepts for exploring evolutionary phenomena that cannot easily be understood in, standard evolutionary, uh, in terms of standard evolutionary explanations. And in the case of cultural evolution, EES concepts allow us to extend our thinking and hypothesizing beyond the adaptationism that's central to processual archaeology. Two of the several concepts associated with the EES are multi-level selection and niche construction. Multi-level selection, as the name implies, sees selection acting uh, not only at the level of individuals, as is typically taught in biology classes, but also at the level of the group. 
Now, historically, the idea of group selection has been controversial within evolutionary biology for reasons I'd be happy to, to discuss at a later time. Um, but some have argued that it's well suited to explaining cultural change. The basic idea behind group selection uh, and cultural evolution is that selection for, uh, selective forces can act more on the cultural differences between groups than on the differences between individuals within groups, which again has been argued to be uh, to possibly account for some of the major cultural transitions we observe archaeologically. So multi-level selection attempts to account for micro scales and macro scales, sometimes panning back and forth between them, as we'll see in some of this session's talks. Another concept under the EES rubric, niche construction, maybe a bit more familiar in name at least. Uh, niche construction theory has much in common with dual inheritance theory, which appears in the title of this session, and about which you may also have heard. Um, incidentally, I'm, I'm realizing now that I should probably rename the title of this session uh, because some of the talks that, that uh, are included are much broader in scope than just dual inheritance and, and quantitative um, approaches to the evolution of culture. At any rate, niche construction or biocultural evolution or gene culture coevolution or dual inheritance theory, these all refer to complex interactions between genetic evolution and cultural evolution. That is, changes in genes can lead to changes in culture, can lead to changes in genes, and so on and so on. Or to put it yet another way, as John Odling Smee, a, a modern champion of niche construction theory, the way he phrases it is, evolution is a system of feedbacks in which previously selected organisms drive environmental changes and organism modified environments subsequently select for changes in organisms. Uh, we modify the very environments to which we then adapt. As archaeologists, we might be thinking, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense and, and aligns well with the things that I see in stratigraphic sequences. And in fact, similar principles um, were mentioned at last night's plenary and also in some of the talks already given today. Uh, Julia saltini Semeraris comes immediately to mind, this idea of feedbacks at multiple scales, right? So um, in many cases, the, the differences are really more methodological um, in that studies that incorporate niche construction and multi-level selection and other EES concepts uh, as defined by evolutionary biologists, increasingly incorporate sophisticated computational method, methods such as complex networks analysis, uh, model selection using information criteria, and others. These methods can be used to model the underlying dynamics of evolutionary change, to assess the relative importance of different uh, environmental and social factors in the distributions of traits, for example, uh, among other things. And we'll get a sense of this in some of the, the coming talks to which I, you know, I'm, I swear I'm about to introduce them. Um, just one last point that I would like to add in this introduction, um, which is that this approach has really been gathering mass in recent decades. And in fact, a formal multidisciplinary field of study has de developed around the idea of cultural evolution. Russell Gray is current director at Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary uh, Anthropology in Leipzig. And he said in a recent paper uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science Sciences that, quote, this multidisciplinary field of cultural evolution is currently beginning to blossom, end quote. In support of this, he and his co-author Joseph Watts of the University of Oxford um, show Google Scholar search results for the term, quote, cultural evolution during the 60 year span indicated in the figure here. Now, if we were to do a similar search constrained to the field of archeology, span we would probably see a very similarly shaped curve with an earlier inflection point even. Uh, after all, as I mentioned, cultural evolutionism has been a mainstay of processual archeology span since about 1960, but the overall numbers would be smaller. And this figure reflects increased attention across multiple disciplines uh, and cross-pollination among those disciplines spurred partly by the extended evolutionary synthesis, which saw reinvigorations both in the 1980s and the early aughts uh, but also just it reflecting too a broad interest in how and why culture changes or a broadening interest. Um, there's now a vibrant cultural evolutionary uh, cultural evolution society founded founded in the early 2010s, and some of the founding members were surveyed in 2017 to identify the major scientific questions and grand challenges currently facing the study of cultural evolution. The results were published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. Um, you, can, you can look that up and read what they had to say about that. Our speakers today uh, are attempting to tackle some of these very grand challenges. Indeed, all the speakers in this session are at the leading edge of these approaches, incorporating EES principles and often cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural approaches to exploring cultural evolution.
I'm very excited to hear more about this from our speakers, and we'll now invite them to tell us more about why these concepts are important, how they're changing our understanding of change in the past, and how they reflect the evolution of cultural evolutionary thought. All right, and so our first speaker is Dr. Stephanie Crabtree. I'm switching now to, to notes here. Um, pardon me. Dr. Crabtree is assistant professor of socio-environmental modeling in the Department of Environment and Society at Utah State University. She's also a biosocial complex systems fellow at Santa, the Santa Fe Institute. She also also holds external affiliations at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, the Center of Interdisciplinary Research in Paris, the Australian Research Council Center for Excellence for Australian Biodiversity and Heritage. Before joining the faculty at Utah State, Dr. Crabtree was a postdoc in the Human Environmental Dynamics Laboratory at the Pennsylvania State University. She holds two PhDs, one in anthropology from Washington State University and one in human sciences and the environment from Université de Franche-Comté in Minnesota. Just kidding. In <laughs> France, of course. Uh, her research explores human environment interactions, particularly how the actions and interactions of individuals with each other and their environment, environments can have large overarching consequences for ecosystems and societies. She primarily uses complex systems modeling such as agent-based and network modeling to explore these interactions, and she's particularly interested in the development of social complexity, human resilience, and feedbacks between ecosystems, ecosystem health and human health, pardon me. She also combines these complex systems methodologies with archaeological field research, and in that regard, she's currently co-directing the Northern Mongolia Archaeology Discovery and Science Project, uh, and she's done field work in the backcountry of Mesa Verde, in France, and in the western deserts of Australia. Her work has been published in PNAS, American Antiquity, Human Ecology, Journal of American Archaeological, uh, sorry, Journal of Archaeological Science, and Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, just to name a few. Today, she will be talking to us about understanding human past and present via agent-based modeling. Uh, please uh, join me at the podium, Dr. Stephanie Crunch. Thank you. Oh, wait. I didn't wait for the green light. Sorry. Thank you so much for the invitation, Raven, and for um, everyone here at UMA for inviting me to give a talk here today. It's been a fantastic two days so far of meeting, of seeing uh, colleagues, meeting new colleagues and future friends. Um, and I have to say that after spending so much time with so many of you on the Hollywood squares over the past two years, it's so nice to hug people and things like that. So when Raven contacted me, she said she wanted me to talk about agent-based modeling, which is definitely something I do. But so before I, I became, before I went to grad school, I was a professional musician in that I got paid very, very poorly. Um, and I was reflecting with Alicia Ventresca Miller the other day that um, giving talks is kind of like being a touring musician where you tour with an album. And so last year was my migration in Australia tour. The year before that was my archaeoecology tour. And so now we're going into the catalog for the agent-based modeling tour. Um, so I'll be kind of talking about what is agent-based modeling? Why should archaeologists do it? How does Michigan influence agent-based modeling? I'll give you a little bit on things that I've done. And hopefully this can give you a taste of things that you can do. So. We're archaeologists. A lot of the time when we go to a site, we find something that looks like this. How many of you know what this is? Anyone want to call out what it is? OK, we're shy. It's all right. These are mealing bins. And these are, uh, this is a picture I took at Chaco Canyon. And what these are used for is for grinding down things to flour, essentially. So as archaeologists, we could go to this site and we could say quite a bit about this. We could say these are fairly formal in that they are placed in the ground. They're not movable like a movable mano and matate. 
Um, we could count them. There's one, two, three, four, five of them. And if we were to take one of the grinding slicks and send it to Dr. Ventresca Miller's lab, she'd be able to tell us quite a bit about the residues that are on there. And we would be able to say more than likely that we can understand that there was maize ground on these grinding slicks. But what we can't get at by this is that the act of grinding maize into flour is a task that was enjoyed mostly uh, by women um, of ancestral, of uh, the descendant communities of the ancestral Pueblo people who ground that. And that it is a task that a lot of the time these women would look forward to. They would be provisioning their families and they would be able to get together and talk with their friends while they were doing it. They would be forming relationships while doing this important task of provisioning their families. So the question is, how do we get from this to this? Well, this is why, oh, look at that font. That said things. And this was at one time a video, but that's okay. You can just imagine it. Oh my goodness. Okay, it says there are 140 slides. So hopefully there aren't actually, there are 19, I promise. <laughs> I think that it's going to make me flip through the, the videos, but that's okay, It'd be a flip book. So why I'm drawn to complex adaptive system science is that it gives us a way to understand how the actions and interactions of individuals lead to larger overarching structures like this tree. What complex systems tells us is that the ways that people interact with each other can, be, can lead to something greater than the sum of its parts. And so for archaeology, this is very attractive because a lot of the time what we see is the end point in history. We see what people did over time. We see the structure when it was abandoned, essentially. And so complex adaptive systems can give us ways to drill down, to see what happened over time, to see the processes that helped to form the archaeological record. I think that this quote by Stephen Jay Gould really encapsulates this. He says, wind back the tape of life to the early days of the Burgess Shale. Let it play again from an identical starting point and the chance becomes vanishingly small that anything like human intelligence would grace the replay. Well, it's a provocative quote to be sure, but it really gets at these contingencies of history. It matters that people interacted with each other and the ways that people interact lead to who we are today and us sitting in this room together. And so complex systems can help us get there. Now, for those in the audience who um, are unfamiliar with agent-based modeling and what models are, I'm going to do a very brief little 101 on that. You can all zone out if you already know this. So what is a model? A model is a simplified representation of something in the real world. So here I have a model airplane on the right, and you can see that it has a little propeller, it has a rudder in the back, tail, and it has wings, and maybe if you threw it, it would conform to Bernoulli's principle and it would float for a little while. So thus, this has proportions of what you'd see in reality, but this is not the real thing. I did not ride on this airplane to get from Utah to here yesterday but it can help us to understand it. If we were to hand this airplane to a child, it would help them to understand what airplanes are. So a simulation then is a model plus time. So we use our simplifications of the real world. We add some time to them to understand what happens over time. So agent-based modeling is a type of computational simulation that I use. So why would you build a simulation? Some of the reasons are building the real thing would be way too expensive. Costs often constrain what we do. With human systems, it would be immoral to experiment on them for something that you wanted to know. So to take an archeological example, let's say you wanted to understand what kind of effects salting the fields would have. Well, it would be very immoral to go to where is, you know, Northern Africa, modern Carthage now and do that. So you build a simulation to see what effects it had on people in the past. We may have no access to the real system. 
You know, we have to, we can't just put scientists in some little teleportation cube and send them to the Horsehead Nebula. We have to build simulations that are based on data that we can get and observe what we can put into our model and then simulate it over time. We build simulations when we are interested in a process and we cannot observe it. So I think this is very relevant for the archeological record because every single one of us is interested in something that we were not able to directly observe. We don't have time machines yet, too bad and maybe thankfully. But we can use simulations built on things we know about people, things we know about the past, and that can help us to refine our hypotheses. It can help us to discard things that um, aren't true. So now I'm going to go over and talk to you about agent-based modeling at the University of Michigan. One of the foundational agent-based models here pictured, Artificial Anasazi, um, was actually co-authored by someone who was a PhD student in political science here at University of Michigan at the time. This is the foundational model that a lot of people say when they talk about agent-based modeling and archaeology. This model looked at a link between population of ancestral Pueblo people living in Longhouse Valley and agricultural production. And it really kind of revolutionized the field. So most of the other authors are not affiliated, but this directly comes out of the genealogy of, of thought here at University of Michigan. I apologize for the formatting on these slides. I'm a Mac user, and so you know, you can imagine they were beautiful. One, a, a person who I really do need to uh, talk about is, um, is pictured here. So this individual, um, Rick Riolo, uh, was a, a research professor in the uh, Complex Systems Center here at University of Michigan. He co-authored more than 80 agent-based modeling papers with students at University of Michigan. He's taught students agent-based modeling for two decades. And unfortunately, he passed away in 2018 after a long illness. But Rick was instrumental in building the field of agent-based modeling here at University of Michigan and was a very patient teacher, I have heard, making sure that people here who wanted to use this tool understood that. He has this wonderful paper as well that looks at agent-based modeling versus equation-based modeling. And it's very understandable for a social scientist as well. And so at the doorstep of Michigan, there was someone who was training this army of students to go out into the world. I am not a student at Michigan. I've actually never even applied. Um, but Rick's work directly impacted me. There are other individuals here uh, from University of Michigan who, uh, did, who led the field in agent-based modeling. Bob Axelrod is probably the one who really brought this to the forefront. And I've actually heard that the reason it's called agent-based modeling instead of individual-based modeling, which is what they call it in ecology, is because of a meeting at the Santa Fe Institute that he was a part of. And he didn't want the initials of it to be IBM, which is the computers that you're running it on. So he chose the word agent, is the story I've heard. Um, Bob has recently retired, uh, but his book here, The Complexity of Cooperation, which looks at game theory and agent-based models, really fundamental. Scott Page, who has uh, recently moved from the Complex Systems Center over to the business school, also has used a lot of agent-based modeling in his work. Elizabeth Brook, who is uh, associated with the Complex Systems Center, um, does agent-based modeling for a lot of her very interesting research. And then of course, the Artificial Anasazi paper, um, which uh, was written by a graduate of Michigan, Ross Hammond, who has done a lot of work on health disparities in communities. He's in public health now um, and has gone forward with agent-based modeling in his work. So all of this comes from Michigan. Um, and I don't believe that there has been quite as much cross-pollination between agent-based modeling in the Complex Systems Center and UMA as there could be. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of my work, a case study of agent-based modeling, to show you what you could do with this. So in the mid-2010s, I started to be interested in trying to understand 
Something about ancestral Pueblo people's way of life over the 700 years that they lived in Mesa Verde um, and understand whether or not people were hierarchical or people were egalitarian. So in the 1980s especially, there was this pretty vociferous debate that centered on people who either excavated in Chaco Canyon, who saw these monumental architecture, this, they, there are copper bells, there are pots that have chocolate inside of them, there are macaws, there are all these beautiful things that indicate hierarchy. It indicates a person who had more things. But then you talk to ethnographers who work with the descendant communities, who look at the archeological record, and there are some very strict leveling mechanisms for modern Pueblo groups. And they say that if you look at a lot of the archeology, span it does not conform to something that would be hierarchical. And so I was interested in going into this debate and understanding what we could learn from agent-based modeling, from ethnographic record, and from archeology span to address this question. So my approach was that if I can measure things in the archeological record, and then I can build a simulation where I know everything that goes into that simulation, then I'll be able to make a comparison between the two. One of the reasons this debate went on and on is because we can't necessarily find the right thing in archeology. span We're caring about relationships. We're caring about how, how people build their communities. And so what I ended up doing, oh good, it is a simulation. Okay, I don't have to flip through a bunch of slides. So if I can measure things in the archeological record and then I can compare them against the simulation, then that will tell me something. So what I did, so this is a video of one of the simulations that I ran and what you are seeing are dots on a landscape. So what? Well, what these dots are showing you is that in this simulation, there are people who are maize farming and they are running up against um, other groups, their land, and they're coming potentially into conflict over arable land. And so they are deciding whether or not to engage in conflict. I am explaining five years of research to you in three slides. So um, it's very oversimplified. But in the simulation, I know everything that they are doing. And I run this hundreds of times with different parameters based on things we know ethnographically and archeologically. And then I can measure the sizes of the groups that form. Then I can compare those measurements against things we actually see archeologically. The size of ceremonial structures, their kivas, the size of their settlements, and how those change over time. So what did I end up finding out? What I found out was that both sides are right. At certain times in the past, Pueblo people were very egalitarian. And at certain times in the past, hierarchy developed. What I mean by this is I got distributions of the um, sizes of these different things I was measuring. And I looked to see whether these distributions conformed to the law of proportional effect, which would be a log normal distribution, or the law of preferential attachment, which would be a power law distribution. And I looked at the reason that these things make a difference. The reason that these are something that I can actually compare the simulation to is because if you think about a city, a city pulls in more people than a smaller community would. Sometimes stadiums are very, very big. I was a postdoc for two years at Penn State. The stadium there can hold every single human being in state college, but it brings a bunch of people in to watch football. It is conforming to this law of preferential attachment. People are drawn to it. So it, it brings in more than it should. It, it punches above its weight, if you will. Whereas the law of proportional effect is essentially like um, age and height. So if you think of a child, a seven-year-old should be generally taller than a four-year-old. They grow at kind of a, a normal-ish rate. There is variability within you know, humans, but that is a proportional growth. And so if I were to look at Seattle versus Washtucknow, Washington, 
I would be able to say something about how those relate. So the reason that this matters is because what I saw is that early on in the simulation and early on in the archeological record, Pueblo one times, we see a log normal effect. We see that people are not taking more than they should, but over time, the growth of Chaco in the archeological record and in the simulation with just these small things going on, what we see is we see a growth of hierarchy. And then in the simulation, I see this hierarchy fall apart over time with the um, fluctuations in the rainfall and other uh, weather things underlying the simulation. What this tells me is that when we look at the archeological record, we can make these inferences and we can use the simulation to help us refine our hypotheses. We see this change in hierarchy from the greatness of Chaco to these kind of local, um, regional ways of being. Okay, so why does this matter? Agent-based modeling, in the case of this work, helps to settle some debates. Um, the paper came out in 2017. It's called How to Make a Polity, if you want to read it. Um, and it has been, I think, very helpful in trying to understand the archaeological record. I think that simulations can be really useful because you can give agency to your agents. They can interact with each other and do something interesting. Other models, not in archaeology, have been very instrumental for our day-to-day -day life, such as SIR models. Do you know what SIR models are? So these underlie your day-to-day -day life of the last two years. These are susceptible, infected, and recovered models. The one I have a screenshot of was built by my friend Paul Smaldino early in March of 2020. And what this tells you is when you're looking at r not, which all of us know if we've been reading the New York Times for the last two years, and we look at interactions of people on a day-to-day -day basis, how, how does that lead to the spread of COVID-19? So this actually, these types of models underlie a lot of cities' responses, including the city of Ann Arbor. Of course, there, this one's very simplified. A lot of people have worked on these models and made them um, more relevant to local case studies. One of my projects that is outside of archeology span that was recently published is using these kinds of SIR models and mask wearing to understand the co-evolution of mask wearing as its own kind of epidemic, so a beneficial epidemic, us choosing to wear masks when things are not so great, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's the basis of a lot of this research. So how does an archeologist get involved in this? It turns out that archeologists need to know a lot of things about human behavior. And so we can, we have a lot to offer to the world with the things that we know about the past. And the past then can be used to understand the present and the future. So if, I've, if me talking about this has made you at all interested, uh, last year I published, along with two co-authors, Isa Romanovska and Colin Wren, a book, Agent-Based Modeling for Archaeology, Simulating the Complexity of Societies from SFI Press. It is um, freely available through that link there on SFI Press's website, or it's about $10 on Amazon. And it goes through, we, we rebuilt 140 archeologically based agent-based models and teach people principles for how to build models. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you about this, okay? Um, that's it, that's, that's my plug, it's free, so enjoy. Agent-based modeling can also be very useful for outreach because it's game-like. It's something that you can hand to the groups who you are working with. And this is something that I've done quite a lot. A lot of the time as archeologists, we talk about these big things and use, use giant words that don't necessarily make any sense. And we can hand a model to people and help them understand. So this model that I'm showing you here is one that I use for teaching my undergraduates um, about ecology. This is the Lotka Volterra predator-prey dynamics, which most of you have probably heard about, but they're a pair of beautiful coupled differential equations that you can see in the upper left. And if you solve those, you see an oscillation kind of like on the right. Um, but that is very opaque for a lot of students. Whereas if you use a, an agent-based model here, 
the wolf sheep predation model that I'm showing in the bottom. We have grass that regrows, we have sheep that eat it, and we have wolves that eat the sheep. And I can teach my students this and have them play with the parameters and see how darn hard it is to get it to balance. It's so easy to make the ecosystem crash. And this is something that I think archeologists can really use. We understand when people did things in the past. The past is just experiments with sustainability. People wanted to have the best lives they could. And so we can use agent-based models as a way of storytelling. And so I, I have another paper about that. And again, this Mac to PC formatting, sorry. And now for something completely different, um, but I since um, I'm starting this session and Melinda Zeter is going to be ending the session, I had to uh, mention that my work has been greatly influenced by her work, um, as well as many, if not most of you in the room. And I have a paper that just came out towards the science of archaeoecology and trends in ecology and evolution with my co-author Jen Dunn, where we talk about how the work that every single person in here is doing, where we're looking at people and ecosystems, can be a partner for modern ecological studies. Paleoecology exists. Archaeologists, we have middens and house floors and beautiful excavations that can be a greater partner with ecological research. And one of the things that we suggest are agent-based models, food web models, bringing in palynology and zooarchaeology and everything that we do can be a greater partner in all of this work. So that is everything that I have to tell you today. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Uma. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I was looking at the number of slides and I was like, oh my gosh, those are my slides? No, it's all of them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. I anticipate a, a pulse in purchases of your book. I teach short courses. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Anna Prentice, who holds the rank of Regents Professor, the top professorial rank awarded by the University of Montana. And she is in fact only the 12th faculty member ever to have been so named. She was also inducted last year into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She co-edits Hunter-Gatherer Research, which is the journal produced by the International Society for Hunter-Gatherer Research. Her own research focuses on the ancient histories of indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest, Rocky Mountains, and Arctic regions of North America, and on cultural evolutionary processes. She has a long-standing and very well-funded research project at the Bridge River Pit House site in interior British Columbia, where, where she has been testing cutting-edge evolutionary ideas with rich archaeological data for the last many years. She's written, co-authored, or co-edited 11 books, if I'm not mistaken, if I've counted correctly, um, including the 2019 Handbook of Evolutionary Research in Archaeology. She's also written more than 80 peer-reviewed articles, which appear in journals such as Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, Current Anthropology, American Antiquity, Human Ecology, and Journal of Archaeological Science. Much of her archaeological fieldwork is done in partnership and close consultation with local stakeholders, particularly tribal and First Nations members. The list of her other roles, memberships, awards, and accomplishments is far too long to detail here. And how she manages all of this, I don't know, because she's also a devoted and attentive mentor to many, many graduate students, to which I can attest firsthand, because she advised my MA thesis uh, nearly 20 years ago now, we realized in the elevator yesterday. Uh, <laughs> many of her recent publications explore the application of macroevolution in archaeological analysis, and today she'll be talking to us about fitness landscapes and cultural macro. Mac macroevolution, UMA, UMA contributions, and some future directions. Hi, all. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Thank you, Raven. Wow. <laughs> I'm really honored to be here. I think this is a great event. It's wonderful to share ideas with, with everyone here. Um, Having, having sat through some fabulous sessions earlier today and last night, I feel like I'm inclined to tell you a little bit more about me um, before we jump into evolutionary theory. Um, I work with indigenous people in addition to thinking a lot about evolutionary issues. Uh, I, I work with a, a particular indigenous group called Hoisten, 
the Bridge River Indian Band. Uh, they are members of Statlium, the, the, or the Upper Lowit people. Uh, 20 years ago, I had a conference and a, a long series of discussions with, with members of Hoisten and Statlium. And, and we, we talked about ways of knowing the past and learning about different ways we could get to history and get to understanding cultural variation. They were intensely interested in working on ideas and thinking about their own history. And so we developed a partnership and we predicated that partnership on mutual acceptance of each other's ways of thinking and knowing. I know I'm not quite to evolution yet, but I'm gonna get there. Um, and we recognize that traditional learnings were important and, in, and exceptionally important to thinking about Hoisten archeological record. But we also recognize that some so-called Western ways of knowledge would be good complements as well, evolutionary theory being one of them. So I work in multiple frameworks. I, I like to think in evolutionary terms, but I, I also will think in indigenous ways of knowing. I'll think in terms of uh, political economy sometimes and so-called post-colonial theory. But today I, get, I have the luxury of talking about evolutionary theory. And so uh, a while back, Raven contacted me and, uh, and asked me to, think, to develop a talk about models and uh, macroevolution and the, and the UMA contribution. And so I wanted to do that. And to do that, I think I wanted to talk about fitness landscape models and adaptive landscape models, because this is an area where we see this intersection. The, uh, the UMA faculty uh, and some, some uh, graduates have made seminal contributions to thinking about culture change. I mean, that was central to processual archeology, span thinking about the long-term and the short-term, thinking about transitions, small transitions, hunter-gatherer technologies, uh, subsistence strategies, or big transitions, origins of food production and food storage, origins of inequality, uh, development of state-like polities, things like that. And sometimes some of these graduates and some of these faculty members used landscape models as a guide for ways of thinking about the past. And that's why these models are particularly useful. And models in general, and I especially thank Stephanie for talking about models. Uh, I don't have to do it and, and give you the same introduction, so I won't bore you with that. Um, but models are, are useful thought experiments. And landscape models are useful thought experiments, in this case, of, not about human decision-making per se, but about long-term evolutionary process, uh, thought about in terms of uh, both microevolution and macroevolution. So, what I want to do today is take us back nearly 100 years and start with Sewell Wright and, uh, and his fitness landscapes and, uh, and what that's kind of the trajectory that's sort of set in motion and think about micro to macro issues and how archaeologists have used some of these ideas. And then I'm going to think about where we could go in the future and some, some sort of uh, a really interesting thinking coming out of evolutionary biology and how it sort of may connect with how we understand the long-term archeological record. Okay, so we're right. So think early 1930s. So we're right is got a lot is doing a lot of math. He's, this is the early days of, of evolutionary genetics and most people don't understand what the heck he's talking about. So he thinks, how am I going to get people to get their heads around genetic evolution in all of its complexities. So he develops this, this thing on the left, this uh, two-dimensional uh, model that shows a couple of genotype variants and a contour map showing relative fitnesses of different potential combinations. And he thinks out loud, evolution might be visualized as peak crossing, as, as crossing from one hilltop through a, a risky valley to another hilltop. Now, this is a simple idea that's generated a ton of debate and a lot of really interesting productive discussion, and it remains influential in many circles, despite the debate. 
by 1939, Wright was, was responding to uh, commentary and discussion and noted that there was many different scenarios that, that one could imagine with, in, a, in adaptive landscapes. And there is a dis subtle distinction in fitness, in, in fitness landscapes and adaptive landscapes. Um, for example, uh, a, a and B deal with stabilizing selection under different degrees of mutation, uh, so narrower or wider. Or C being uh, peak crossing under environmental change. So a population, the environment is changing and a population sort of crawls up onto a peak as the, as the environment changes. Or D and E, where we have uh, different aspects of drift uh, playing out. And, uh, and finally, F, and I'll come back to F uh, in another slide, where we have, imagine many, many local populations with in sharing genes with one another, and uh, some are better adapted, or some, not, some traits are better adapted than others. And over time, the best adapted, because they're gene sharing, pulled the whole population up, up the peak. So Wright was thinking about this. Now, now be aware that Wright was thinking about this in microevolutionary terms. This is, these are microevolutionary models. But they have nonetheless been influential to those who wanted to think in the big picture and think about macroevolution. So this is from Arnold et al. in 2001, where they did that, where they thought, uh, we can use the simple logic of, of Sewell Wright and think about long-term patterns. So for example, we have multivariate drift on a flat landscape. Or imagine a curved landscape, a la sort of the bumpy landscapes of, of Sewell Wright, where we could have imagine a number of macroevolutionary scenarios. We could have stasis with subtle variation over time, which is A. Or we could have a period of stasis and then, and then steady change thereafter, which is B, or two uh, scenarios that uh, basically imply punctuated equilibria. Uh, we have stasis follow with, with, with some variability, uh, then a jump, and then stasis again, basically anagenesis, or we could have cladogenesis with, with stable beginnings and, uh, and stable outcomes. This thinking has not been just by evolutionary biologists, evolutionary anthropologists have gone here as well. Boyd and Richardson in 1992 published a paper where they, they used actually a map from the Rocky a contour map from the Rocky Mountains to show a really rugged con uh, contour, I, I love that, um, where they basically said, look, microevolutionary principles, if you play them out over, over enough long term, long time spans, could give rise to history, in effect, macroevolution. So this idea was, was, was influential. It caused a lot of people to, a lot of anthropologists, no, not a lot of anthropologists, but some anthropologists, and a, a number of archeologists to think about, uh, could, could we imagine archeological scenarios where we see uh, fundamental cultural microevolutionary process, cultural transmission between individuals across populations, and could that lead to major behavioral changes and cultural changes? So there's a number of uh, archeological case studies I'd like to quick walk us through just to give you some of the flavor of that. Um, I'm gonna take a drink because my voice is failing. If I can get this open, there we go. Okay. All right. Chuck Spencer, graduate of, of uh, University of Michigan, has been one of the best, strongest, most explicit advocates of using uh, adaptive landscape models to think about culture change. F Spencer is part of the, the long-term UMA investigation in Oaxaca, looking at the origins of state-level society uh, at, or in and around Monte Alban. Uh, and Spencer came up with, a, I, th I thought, a really creative model for thinking about emergence of state-like polities. Uh, he called it his extrapolation model. In essence, the way it works is you, you have big ideas developed in, in one quarter, and those ideas trans transmitted across a landscape, in this case with the help of military force, <laughs> and, uh, and enforced, and then this repeated multiple occasions, 
and leading to putting together something that begins to look rather different than what happened before. How is this peak crossing? Well, you start out on one peak, to Spencer, you start on, on one peak, and, the, and we'll, we'll use the term chiefdom here. Uh, Tim Pogatas not in the room, is he? <laughs> um, you start with something like a chiefdom-like polity, and, uh, uh, and then these, I, these ideas are developed and put into play and transmitted, and then you go through this sort of risky experimental stage where you're transmitting it across the landscape and it might catch, it might not, it might be enforced, it might not, but it does catch it and, and natural selection sort of drives it into something uh, new and different. Uh, Spencer and Redmond in 2001 sh showed uh, multi-level selective process happened during this situation. And so uh, they, they made a pretty substantial argument for uh, use of, of landscape models as a metaphor for thinking about state formation. Um, colleagues and uh, various colleagues and I have explored this as well. Uh, we, we thought about hunter-gatherer changes about 20 years ago, uh, thinking about emerge, going from mobile, largely non-storage-based to more sedentary storage-based Northwest Coast peoples. Uh, we thought about it in landscape, in, in sort of righty and landscape terms, as a process by which r subsistence variability was, or problems with subsistence variability were solved by explorations and experiments with food storage as backup. And so crossing the, uh, the hypothetical uh, righty and peak, uh, peaks and troughs uh, was accomplished by uh, drifting off during a period of exploration and experimentation with storage, and then storage becoming locked in and becoming a new, evolving into a sort of a permanent obligate strategy. Uh, Garvey, Raven, and if you haven't seen Raven Garvey's new book on Patagonian archeology, span it's just fabulous. There's a free plug for Raven's book. I just finished reading it. It's one of the best things I've read in a while. Um, but Garvey makes the, uses peak crossing as well, briefly, in the book to think about why didn't northern Patagonians become farmers? Farming was going on just to the north, and, uh, and yet they didn't. And she, she raises the really interesting idea that there might be co evolutionary constraints. There might be constraints to moving off that peak, thinking about sh shifting from uh, a, a mobile situation with limited or no food storage to a food storage situation, or going from a situation where you're substantially egalitarian with substantial food sharing to a more of a private property scenario might might be too much, too many constraints to to uh, permit a sort of this sort of peak crossing to happen. So this is um, so I got one more example, and this is from Flannery and Marcus to in in two, their paper in two thousand where they address the, the, the great debate over Olmec as the mother culture. Uh, this is a great, if you've not read it, this is a great paper. Uh, they, they land on Sewell Wright's 1939 F scenario, where they say, look, Olmec were part of a world of many polities with greater and lesser degrees of viability some of them were quite viable, others maybe were a less, little less viable, but under the right strategy F scenario, the more viable and the is gonna share ideas across the board with all, and the whole thing is gonna drive up in a new direction. So the, another example of, uh, of cultural transmission and uh, a metaphor drawn from the 1930s. Uh, right, okay. So, we can imagine micro to macro scenarios using ideas from, from way back when, simple, simple ideas, and simple models can be powerful to think about macroevolutionary process, at least as, a, as an outcome of persistent microevolution. But I'm gonna ask, what if, when we look at this in the very long term, those models fail? What if we have to look at this in a different way? What if cultural evolution, like biological evolution, on macroevolutionary terms, works under different rules? 
And this right requires us to engage in a different thought experiment. So Sergei Gavrilets, about 20 years ago, began thinking along these lines and thinking about what happens on different scales of evolution. Does evolution work out in different ways on different scales? And so he came up with this rather different model uh, where you have a rugged microevolutionary landscape that intersects with macroevolutionary landscapes with different rules. And so this wonderful graphic kind of shows you that, where we have a rugged, you see the, the bumpy, rugged microevolutionary landscape intersecting with these higher planes. Now, what's going on at those higher planes? The higher planes are, represent macroevolution with, the, with its own rules. In this case, this is a, a holy with an E adaptive landscape. For evolution to happen in this scenario, there's no peak crossing. There's no crossing uh, sketchy troughs or basins between highly adapted peaks. Instead, what you have are causeways between maladaptive holes, basically extinction zones. And evolutionary process in this case is a matter of a variant traveling on causeways. It travels on these causeways by making genotype or genetic additions. And if everything is relatively fit, there's many options. And if there's not a lot of fitness, there's not very many options. So this opens up the possibility of, of variants getting stuck or traversing with very few options for directionality or traveling far or not very far. A helpful way to look at this is through percolation theory drawn from physics. Gavrilet says, imagine a low viability variant on the upper left, where the, the, the variants have few options, the black spots, and sur surrounded by inviable uh, options, we'll, we'll call it. And so, in this case, there's a lot of potential to, to just, something comes about and doesn't change much or change at all. If it does change, it changes slightly over time. But imagine the opposite scenario where we have a high p-value, it's not a probability value, it's a viability value. On the lower right, a p equals 0.65, where we have high viability of our variant and many options, and thus the potential for, for dramatic evolution, fast, multiple directions, what uh, Gavrilets calls a giant component where, in theory, the variant runs the whole table, basically, and we see a rapid evolutionary process. So peak shifting isn't needed. We just simply need the potential for interconnectedness between variant, variants. Okay. Here's another scenario. Close, but it has a little stronger role for natural selection. So this is Crutchfield and Van Nimwegen's scenario in which we have uh, basically these series of basins and, uh, and these tubes. So the basins represent nearly neutral or neutral search zones where a variant comes about and then it searches the landscape, making interconnection, genetic interconnections until finally, at some point, it hits something super viable, and then selection, boom, drives it up to the next sub-basin. And this kind of thing is going on all the time in, in this sort of scenario. So it's similar to Gavrilet's, but it just incorporates these, these instances of sudden rapid change under, under uh, renewed selective force. OK. Uh, can this work for cultural scenarios? Is it worth thinking about? If it does, we might expect periods of cultural stasis, so to speak, and periods of rapid change. We know that happens. Our, our intellectual ancestors who were, were culture, culture historians, they weren't dummies. They saw patterns. 
they saw periods that they called cultures or phases where things were pretty were more or less kind of stable. What they were recognizing was what some evolutionists, evolutionists might call cultural stasis. But the point of these models is that cultural stasis is productive, that things are still going on, that we're seeing variants being fixed into cultural traditions, and maybe they're not changing a lot, or maybe they're just come, come being fixed, and then they're being used a little bit, and then they're not being used a little bit. Niles Eldridge talked about this in, in my book in 2009, where he talked about cornets and the cornet uh, valve systems coming into being, and then just kind of being set aside for 100 years, and, uh, and then being picked up and tinkered with again. And that happens in long-term cultural traditions. So we might imagine these periods of not dramatic change or even just oscillating change, but things coming about and being sort of, in, we used a, gen a genetic term, being, being fixed and, and then persisting at low levels for long periods of time. And then periodically, conditions change, something happens where suddenly a whole bunch of these different variants become interconnected and something happens quite dramatic and we see emergent change where everything, everything's interconnected. Can we see this in the archeological record? I'll give you a couple examples before I, before I use up all my time. Um, so here's the Northwest Coast and Plateau where I work, one of the places I work. Um, the, the old Cordilleran culture would be equivalent to the archaic. Uh, it's long been considered mobile hunter-gatherers, uh, no big patterns of change, a lot of movement, a lot of, a lot of uh, small, small campsites, things. And yet, if you look at the actual archeological record, groundstone appears short, in and around 10,000 years ago, and then just kind of, you don't see it much for a long time. Earth ovens appear before 8,000 years ago, and they don't, aren't used very often either for thousands of years. House structures are there, probably, <laughs> I mean, I mean, formal pit houses appear somewhere around 6,500 to 7,000 years ago. Uh, even storage is around probably much earlier, but at least at a measurable level, a little after 6,000 years ago, long before there were villages and all the trappings of Northwest Coast culture. But something happens at about 4,500 years ago, give or take. We call it the Charles culture, where suddenly everything connects. Suddenly we, we have... Tons of groundstone, tons of earth ovens, tons of house structures, big above ground wooden structures, predicated on storage, food production, social inequality, mass production of trade goods, uh, markers of social inequality. There are burials. There's one woman buried uh, a little after 4,000 years ago within this sort of cultural context with 350,000 stone beads. Um, significant patterns. So we have emergent change. We have this flurry of interconnectedness. Okay. Is, it a, is, it, is, this, a, is this a misnomer? Is it just a one-off? Or do we see it elsewhere? Look at the Bering Strait. In the Bering Strait, we have what's called the Old Bering Sea Culture at about just under, between 1,500 and 2,000 years ago. But it's an outcome of a long process as well um, where we can track East Asian ceramics. Don't see them much in the Bering Strait, but the knowledge is there since the Upper Paleolithic. Houses, semi-subterranean houses, the knowledge has been there for a long time. They appear sometimes, they disappear for a while, and they reappear again. Harpoon systems on the coast have been around for a long time. Ground stone, the same thing. Uh, we see some tweaks at about three, 4,000 years ago, and then at about 2,000 years ago, when we hit the Okvik Old Bering Sea culture and its partner Iputak on the Alaska side, suddenly everything is in play. And we see villages, we see polities, we see social inequality, we see subsistence intensification, we see mass scale warfare, and we see trade interconnections that span the Yukon all the way to China. How do we make sense of that? Is it, can we make sense of that in traditional simple P-crossing models or do we need, some, need a stronger metaphor? I, I suggest we need a stronger metaphor. So to wrap up, um, I'm gonna suggest that we think about a few things. We think about cultural, cultural microevolution is nonstop. We're doing it right now. We're sharing ideas, we're passing on those ideas, we're accepting or rejecting them and, and, and it's having a, a cultural effect. But 
on a higher, longer term scale, some of those ideas get locked in and they get and they persist more commonly or less commonly. And we have the and and then they have and then those have the potential to interconnect with other ideas, and we have these small scale transitions. And these smaller scale transitions aren't as common as microevolutionary processes, but they're happening. And then every once in a while, we have what Zath Murray and Maynard Smith called a great transition. Origins of food production, or the origins of the old Bering Sea culture in the in the Bering Strait. I think it was a great transition. And, uh, and I think we need to theorize this, the, these different scalar transitions better. And I think it's a task for the, for the future. And here's a real landscape. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, our next speaker, here, let me advance a slide here, is uh, Dr. Dietrich Stout. Dr. Stout is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Emory University and Associate Director of Emory Center of, for Mind, Brain, and Culture. He received his PhD in Paleoanthropology from Indiana University, Bloomington. And as it turns out, we share an undergraduate at, uh, alma mater in James Madison University, where he received his BA in Anthropology. Before joining the faculty at Emory in 2009, he was for four years on the faculty in Paleolithic Archaeology at the University College London Institute of Archaeology, and he was an assistant professor of anthropology at George Washington University before that. His research focuses on Paleolithic stone tool making and human brain evolution. His primary methods include archaeological fieldwork and artifact analysis, as well as experimental tool replication, psychometric testing, and brain imaging. Dr. Stout is tremendously prolific and has published in Science, Current Anthropology, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, Journal of Human Evolution, and many other prestigious journals. And his work is hard hitting. For example, his 2002 piece in Current Anthropology titled Skill in Cognition and Stone Tool Production has been cited nearly 600 times. And a series of papers in the 2010s on stone tool making and the evolution of human culture and cognition have been cited several hundred times each. I'm thrilled that he was able to join us for this session, and today he will be giving a talk titled Cumulative Culture, Biocultural Feedback, and the Persistent Concept of Progress in Human Evolution. Dr. Dietrich Stepp. Thank you. Thank you, Raven, for the wonderful uh, introduction, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. And thank you for sticking it out on a Friday afternoon as well. Uh, so the question was uh, asked earlier today uh, about the, uh, the possibility of uh, pursuing uh, social justice issues in the deep past. Uh, well, I work in the very deep past, you know, millions of years ago. And uh, here are some, some things that I've been uh, thinking about and, uh, and writing about recently. Uh, and, uh, you know, you start with saying, like, so I'm going to give you, like, a big picture account of, uh, of human evolution. And, and accounts like this uh, tend to begin with some kind of uh, valorizing statements about how exceptional and wonderful humans are, how we've uh, gone to space, landed on the moon, uh, transformed the world, split the atom, created science and art, uh, and all of these wonderful things. Uh, and even though we all know that you shouldn't talk about biological evolution in progressive terms, in terms of progress, these sorts of things are often described as achievements, attainments, or quite literally as improvements. Uh, so I think that this is uh, uh, distressing um, and something that we need to be uh, careful about. Uh, and uh, we need to really avoid this tendency to fall back into this progressivist reading that in the past uh, and even in the present uh, has been used to justify racist and uh, colonial hierarchies. It has also prevented us from properly understanding uh, the evolutionary systems that we're trying uh, to study. So, I mean, if you're not entirely convinced uh, that this idea of progress in evolution is, is uh, persistent. It is true that sometimes people will admit that, you know, technological change and culture change isn't always for the good. Um, but in fact, even things like, uh, like mass extinction uh, can be pitched 
as progress of a sort. Um, after all, we are the only species that's powerful enough to destroy the planet in this way. Uh, and I've actually heard people say that as sort of a defense of human uniqueness. Uh, so I'm sorry, I didn't, the colors didn't, it's gonna be very hard to read. Uh, but uh, uh, so I, the 20 minutes is not a very long time um, to present uh, nuanced ideas. And I, I wanna make it uh, clear that I'm not trying to uh, point my finger at anybody. And so uh, I think that our, the field in general has a problem, has a progress problem, and I have contributed to it. So this is a, a quote from something I wrote just a few years ago. Um, and uh, I had uh, highlighted, but uh, it's about uh, how uh, uh, culture, cumulative culture has underwritten uh, the demographic success, which I put in white so that it would stand out against the blue <laughs> background. Uh, are you, anyways, it's about a remarkable success and our achievements and our attainments and all this sort of stuff. And this is the kind of thing that apparently I and many other people fall into, especially when you're trying to talk about how important the work is to a broader popular audience, which is exactly the wrong time to be falling into these sort of progressivist tropes. Uh, so anyway, here are, is the, the basic idea as I've understood it um, from uh, uh, the foundational work of, of other people. Uh, and, and basically um, the idea is that other animals in every generation have to essentially reinvent the wheel um, and come up with the same solution again and again because they don't have the ability uh, to learn from each other. Um, whereas humans have this a very fancy high fidelity social transmission, uh, which allows us to, to accumulate uh, uh, good ideas over time uh, and, and generate sequential improvements. The ratchet doesn't slip, so we, we move forward. Uh, and literally, we are talking about improvements, is how it's phrased. And furthermore, we don't even need to necessarily understand what we're doing because simply having biased tendencies to copy people who are successful, for instance, uh, or people who are popular uh, will, or prestigious um, will lead to the blind evolution of effective strategies. Uh, and eventually, this keeps going long enough that produces cultural, adaptive cultural traits that are beyond the inventive capacity of individuals. Like no one individual in their whole lifetime could come up with the idea of the digital calculator on their own from scratch. Uh, and as, as we produce more and more of these, these wonderful cultural innovations out there, that stuff out there for you to learn, and so it becomes more advantageous selection acts to increase, further increase your learning capacity to take advantage of it. And we've got this wonderful feedback, autocatalytic, feedback going on. And, and the really compelling and nice thing about this idea of autocatalytic feedback is that it seems to address sort of a problem in human evolution, you know, which is why we seem to have these, these big, you know, smooth, consistent curves over millions of years uh, of brain size increase, for instance, despite the fact that this occurred in wildly different habitats and modes of adaptations involving different species, and like, and yet it's always the same. A better, bigger brain is always better. What, what, what is this consistency coming from? And the same thing with increasing technological complexity over time. So the idea of this is, it, well, it's not because of all these variable external things. It's because of an internal driver, an intrinsic mechanism that's consistent across this long span of time. So that that seems to be a very nice uh, feature of of this. Uh, now, this autocatalytic model often also leads to the question of, you know, if this is so good and such a great thing, um, why is it that only humans uh, have done this, right? And so the common answer to this is that there's something unique, key feature of humans like high fidelity social learning that's very costly or extremely unlikely to discover in, in, in the outset, but that once you have that, you kind of, you know, it just keeps going and it pays back its own costs with dividends and so forth. Uh, and so this falls into a long tradition of there being a very sharp uh, animal-human boundary or kind of inflection point in human evolution. You know, it used to be that it, this was tool use, like basically, you know, you discover how to use a tool. I don't know if you've seen this, this movie, increasingly people haven't, uh, but, uh, you know, then it tosses it up in the air and it turns into a spaceship, showing that as soon as you figured out how to bash things with a bone, the rest of, you know, cultural evolution is essentially inevitable. Um, similarly, people talking about, uh, talk about a cerebral Rubicon, you know, once you pass a certain amount of 
brain size, you've crossed the Rubicon River like, you know, Caesar, you're going to conquer the world. And now uh, people also use the term Rubicon to describe the origins of, of cumulative culture. Uh, and I, I, I do find, you know, maybe that's, maybe it's true. Maybe that is actually right. But it does seem a little concerning to me that we have this just repeated, the explanation keeps changing, but the framework is always the same, that there's this one thing it made all the difference. And after that, it's, you know, kind of off to the races. We're going to and, and furthermore, you, as you can see in these, these images, there's a strong uh, uh, you know, uh, Im implication of sort of dominance and, and conquering and you know, human exceptionalism, all these things that I find a bit uh, troubling, especially given the history of our field. All right, so where does this really persistent idea of human exceptionalism and progress actually come from? And I don't, I don't know. Um, for years, I've just been sort of vaguely telling my students that this is an idiosyncratic uh, Western cultural concept developed during the Enlightenment, probably for some, like, to justify a revolutionary ideology or something like that. But then why does it have so, such incredible staying power? And so then this, this summer, uh, I read the, the book from uh, Graeber and, and Wengro, which is also mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, they argue um, that the idea of progress is not an accident, it's an explicit response to what they call the indigenous critique of European uh, society, particularly by uh, North American indigenous think thinkers like Condé Aronc. I hope I said that correctly, I've only ever seen it written. Um, and uh, who found uh, European society to be cruel, inhumane, um, with uh, some people working all day to enrich other people, other people starving to death in the streets, uh, and so on. Uh, and according to uh, uh, Graeber and Wingro, this, this, this critique actually did hit home in Europe to some extent uh, until a, uh, a French economist, uh, Turgot, came up with a rebuttal to it um, which was essentially the argument, well, yes, but these are necessary evils. Uh, you know, the, uh, the suffering of some is necessary in order for the advancement of society and the creation of all these things that we value. And then you go off and list each and every one way in which Europeans consider their own societies to be distinctive. And that becomes the definition of progress and the justification uh, for the system that produces it. All right, so the idea of progress is not at all neutral on this reading. I'm not a historian. The book was pretty convincing to me. But, uh, uh, and, and so I think we really, really need to be careful, even if, they, even if they, they're not, we still need to be careful about using concepts like progress and improvement in cultural evolution. And so early models, very helpfully, are quite specific in answering this question about what is improving. And what is improving is biological fitness. Right now, so there is, I, I still think you should just say increase and not improve, um, but there's a, you know, a sort of a principled sense in which improve, increasing reproductive uh, fitness is, a, is an improvement. Um, and so, you know, like so the graph on the right is showing how you can actually get increases in the mean fitness of a population through certain interactions between social and individual learning strategies, right? Um, but that still doesn't get you to these things that are beyond the inventive capacity of individuals. So the idea of uh, cumulative culture of the ratchet effect is that individuals have a given sort of cognitive capacity or reaction norm to uh, improve or to uh, uh, discover different fitness improving uh, behaviors. Um, and that uh, through, this is what, through trial and error learning, which is called guided variation. And basically, if you can't pass on whatever you learned, your solutions are always going to oscillate within this given sort of biologically determined range of your inventiveness, essentially. Uh, so the idea, however, is that if you have high fidelity uh, social learning, improvements can be passed on, you know, and so the starting point of the next generation can be higher than the one previous, or sometimes lower, but usually higher. Uh, and so you actually eventually get to a point where your, your, your minimum is actually above what anybody in the first generation could possibly have discovered on their own. Uh, so the question, though, when you look at this is why can't this person on the, in the first generation discover this really nice fitness, high fitness behavior up there? And that the explicit reason is it is explicitly assumed that more fitness enhancing behaviors are those are more complex, right? That there's a direct, you can just directly translate from fitness to complexity 
uh, in this model, and that's, that's, a, that's why it works. Now, maybe that's true sometimes. I don't know if it's true all the time, um, but we do have to be very careful that we've just elided completely from biological fitness to cultural complexity, whatever that actually is um, that we don't know how to measure. And I think, you know, uh, Turgo would be pleased and we should be really careful about trying to, you know, to, we should mark that at least when we're doing it. And in fact, it's pretty common now to just forget about the fitness entirely and go forward and, and talk about cumulative improvements in complexity as if complexity is, is automatically a good thing. Um, yeah, now I can't even read this. So basically, um, There we go. Okay. There we are again. Okay, so uh, as uh, Masudi and Thornton, I, I, I'm not giving them credit because they're still in yellow. Uh, anyway, they, 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 they wrote this. You know, virtually all definitions of cumulative culture evolution specify improvement as a requirement. Uh, this involves an improvement of some measure of performance, which is a proxy for a genetic and or cultural fitness. Yet the notion of fitness is under theorized um, for example, does knowledge of quantum physics actually enhance the inclusive fitness of its bearers? Uh, there's little evidence of that. Um, so, so we said, well, maybe we should actually be using proxies like monetary uh, or material wealth or social status to be more appropriate for cumulative cultural evolution. Uh, you know, given this disconnect with inclusive fitness, it may be more appropriate to talk of cultural fitness uh, the degree to which a product of, of cultural, cumulative cultural evolution maximizes uh, indirect, uh, indirect, I didn't get to, uh, indirect fitness. So basically the idea is here uh, um, that, you know, we know people don't always maximize reproductive uh, 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 fitness or we don't always uh, maximize fertility. Um, so we're just going to, you know, make this culturally relevant, but I'm not sure what this idea of cultural fitness is actually supposed to be. Is it supposed to be what people in the culture you're studying value? How do you know what if they don't value the things that you think that they should value? And it, it just it could be very circular unless you have some really nice uh, ethnography or something to, to back it up. So I think we need to be really careful about this kind of question of what exactly it is. And I, I think we should just talk about cultural evolution and ditch the cumulative part probably because you already have, you know, inheritance and uh, it's sent with modification and all that. So, but you say, okay, well, hold on. Uh, but you're getting into the weeds. Isn't this, I mean, this is what biological success looks like, right? I mean, uh, we know that we have these, these increases in, you know, in brain size, technological complexity and population. Right, you know, so what's the, you might have a pro ideological problem with the term progress, uh, but these are facts of the paleontological and archaeological record. Um, so I do think that in this case also we should be concerned, you know, whether we're bringing any biases to the table. Um, you know, it is, you know, it seems pretty straightforward and you draw a line here, what's going on. You start plotting uh, some individual points, things get a little bit more messy, but especially if you start attending um, to a couple species that have been discovered in just the past 20 years, these very late uh, occurring, very small brain sizes that really kind of screw up your unilineal progress curve there if you take them seriously. Now, it's just a few anomalies right now, um, but yeah, these have only been found recently, and if we find more, uh, you, you might just start to get a picture that looks a little bit more like this, where instead of having unilineal uh, increase, uh, you know, a directional trend, um, what you actually have is diversification over some kind of minimum like eighth grade cranial capacity, right? And that's a very different evolutionary scenario. Uh, you don't have to come up with one explanation that says why everything always happened this way. In fact, a lot of different things happened. Uh, so it's not clear to me that we're talking about it's one smooth curve with a single explanation uh, as opposed to uh, multiple independent, uh, perhaps contextually particular events that might have multiple different kinds of causes. So it's sort of the macro evolutionary uh, causes that might, uh, it might cause like, uh, you know, lineage splits are different from the gradual micro evolutionary selection envisioned by biocultural coevolutionary feedback type uh, models, right? So, I mean, if you look at it, you, you might actually only have like 
five sort of events going on here, only two of which actually involve a major brain size increase, and one actually very recently appears to be a sharp downturn in brain size. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, but uh, so yeah, th this is a very different sort of thing that needs to be explained, right? And you can say the same thing, and, but much more so actually for, for cultural complexity. For one thing, as I keep saying, we don't actually know how to make, that's why it's in scare quotes here, complexity. Uh, uh, um, and also this is just a drawing, it's not based on any data. Um, but uh, uh, Glenn Isaac did know the archeological record quite well. And you see what he saw was not, you know, one lineage of, of improvement, but an increasing diversification over some sort of minimum uh, here. So the same thing I was talking about in paleontology. Uh, so if you just stop calling it sort of attainment and all of that. Uh, so this is a different uh, uh, picture again than one of unilineal increase. Uh, and in fact, uh, Vesen and Hooks uh, uh, recently made a similar argument um, that there's actually very little empirical evidence um, that human culture change in general is typically cumulative. They say it may happen sometimes, but we don't even know how common that is, uh, which is you know, actually kind of interesting to reflect on the relative absence of, of evidence backing up this as a general uh, feature. Um, I don't have as much of a story about the population increase thing. Uh, and it is kind of hard to argue with the fact that there are 8 billion people on the planet now. Um, but I do think it would be a mistake to assume that humans are always maximizing fertility. In fact, we know that they don't. Um, and also to assume that technological complexity is always the key limiting factor, because it seems that sometimes it's not. Um, and we should be open to the possibility that prehistoric populations, prehistoric people made choices about fertility, um, and that technological intensification is as likely to have been a consequence of changes in fertility and population size as always being modeled as the, the, the cause of it. You know, so for example, uh, Demetzer and colleagues recently argued that a uh, long-term trend towards technological intensification in the Levant was actually driven by the depletion of the favored resources, and then you, get, you kind of back yourself into a corner and you have to work harder uh, and use more kind of technology to exploit smaller, smaller game. So that's not exactly autocatalytic improvement. Uh, um, so what about the idea that the origins of cumulative culture mark a sharp discontinuity or a, uh, a major evolutionary transition? Uh, so I've already noted that this is a bit of a trope uh, in, uh, in evolutionary studies, but there's a specific cultural evolutionary argument for this. Um, so first, we've got to ask, what is the uh, definition of culture? So start, start small, right? Uh, and in, in these invisible quotes here, um, Boyd and Richardson very, very uh, helpfully uh, spell out that culture is information. And culture is information that's transmitted socially. And this is important because it means that culture is like genes uh, and it is a, uh, it's very cheap to uh, replicate uh, and uh, transmit as compared to individual learning, um, which is sort of like maybe growth and development, I guess, if you want a biological metaphor, um, which requires a lot of work to do. Right? And so that what, what makes culture evolve in this way that's explicitly analogical to genetic evolution, because culture is information. Um, so then the argument goes that individual learning is costly to do, but the ability to do it is cheap. Everybody can do trial and error learning. This is just you know uh, 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 reinforcement learning. Whereas social learning is cheap to do, although you just talk to me and I get the idea and we're done, um, but the capacity to do that, to have things like language and theory of mind is very costly sort of physiologically, right? So furthermore, prior to cumulative culture evolution, the only behaviors that were out there to copy were the ones that individuals could come up with on their own. So it wasn't really, didn't make any sense to invest in all this you know, expensive learning equipment when there wasn't anything great out there to learn. Um, so there's an adaptive valley that you have to cross through before you know, cumulative cultural evolution can take off. And there's this, this, this kind of sweet spot here where the things are you know, hard enough to learn, but not too hard to learn. And there's enough people who are learning culturally you know, and, and for it to take off. So it's this very narrow pathway to human life. And that's the startup problem, which is summarized also here. Um, 
But anyway, I just described it, so you don't need to hear about that. Um, so there are problems for the, uh, uh, the startup problem, in my mind. So first off, you know, the, the cultural reproduction is not just information copying, right? You know, you take some, like, these people are, are outside my lab here learning to make uh, hand axes, you know, and you can't just tell somebody, right? There might be some things that are easy to transmit, like you can learn a joke really quick, but a lot of the things that actually are helpful to improving your subsistence and, and so forth, actually you have to learn over a long period of practicing, coaching, supportive learning, you know, all these like, uh, there's skills that you develop over time. So you can't just say it's just, you know, like template copying, like DNA, right? Um, and, and when you look at real world learning like this, there's also no clear line between the social and individual aspects of it. You know, so this person here is engaged right now, you know, they're looking down, some, doing some trial and error learning, you know, does that make that individual learning? But, you know, he wouldn't be there or have these objects, you know, or be in this situation without a big social scaffolding and support. And it just gets really hard to tease apart what's supposed to be individual, what's supposed to be uh, social. And, you know, not surprisingly then, it doesn't appear that there are these dedicated and different social versus non-social uh, learning uh, uh, circuits in the brain. It appears it's all learning that happens in different kinds of contexts, right? So... The idea that, that cultural reproduction is information uh, transmission is exemplified by this, the island test. And this is the idea that if you grew up alone on an island, what would you be able to reinvent on your own in a single lifetime? And so the idea is, you know, probably most of us could come up with a chimpanzee-style digging stick, um, but nobody is going to reinvent cell phones, right? So the, clearly that's because this is, you know, generations of accumulated knowledge, and this is the proof of concept that, you know, that's how it works. You could only do this with all this knowledge you've accumulated. Um, so then, I, well, let's have an extension. Let's imagine you're on the, the island alone by yourself, but you also have a cell phone, right? Now you could copy it. Well, you, even, you can call anybody you want, download plans, all the instructions for how to make a cell phone. Could you now make a cell phone? Of course not, because you know technological uh, innovation and technological change in production is about more than just information. You've got to have the materials, the infrastructure, uh, social institutions, trade networks, and so on and so on. And you can't just reduce that to information. Uh, you know, yeah, across different uh, kinds of technologies, for instance, it's not a content neutral thing technological evolution, uh, you know, these different technologies are going to be relying on different kinds of cognition, different kinds of social, economic, and material causes that are going to be specific to particular cases, right? So cultural evolutionary theorists know this. Right? So here's a, a, a table from a 2013 publication. You know, it's got everything on there from intrinsic features of the technology to uh, social institutions that are going to affect the rate of technological change. Um, but the way this is treated, though, is that's a modifier. That's approximate modifier of the evolutionary process. And the ultimate explanation is still in population level uh, replication um, and selection of informational content, right? And so what I'm suggesting is that um, we need to move away from that and move to a uh, more developmentally based uh, uh, idea of what culture is. And I think it's, it, you know, it, it's actually similar to what has been said about biological evolution and the extended evolutionary synthesis that Raven help, helpfully introduced. And I think that's kind of ironic because a lot of the people, cultural evolution is a big part of the EES. And a lot of the people who contribute to developing this idea that you know, actually Evolution is not all about genes and information. You can also inherit niches, and there's all sorts of extra genetic processes and inheritance. And the genes don't just, you know, print out a program that makes your body. There's, there's, there's constructive interactions and developmental processes. Well, they, then they turn around and treat culture like the modern synthesis used to treat, just gene-centric. You know, so you can just substitute, like, information here, and that's all that, 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 that gets inherited. Um, uh, yeah. So basically the quote here is supposed to say, phenotypes are not inherited, they are reconstructed in development. And that's a quote from this article about biological evolution. And I would say, you know, that behaviors or cultural traits are not inherited, they are reconstructed through learning in exactly the same way. Uh, so, I mean, the protracted learning processes that are required for cultural skill or 
uh, uh, reproduction are not simply a process of template copying analogous to DNA replication. Uh, and they tend to blur the boundary, uh, the sharp distinction between social and individual learning common in cultural evolutionary models. Uh, observation and practice are interwoven, you know, kind of a back and forth thing like Andy Whiten had in his helical curriculum here. Um, and they're also uh, benefiting from the inheritance of uh, social situations, relationships, uh, physical structures, the, the contents of a workshop, for instance. Um, so again, this, the, the reproduction of cultural uh, uh, skills and knowledge cannot be just treated as, as purely information-based. Right? Um, so this brings us, the, uh, the final part of this argument was that evolution has, to, natural selection has to select for either individual learning capacity or uh, social learning capacity. And this was based on the idea that they're, they're, they require different dedicated uh, neural systems. That turns out, as far as we can tell, not really to be the case. I won't go into all the brain stuff uh, uh, here, but you might just notice that there's only, this is areas that are unique to social learning, and that is it. That they found in this recent review, the uh, anterior cingulate, cingulate gyrus, and this was identified as being particularly sensitive to the rewards that others get, and that was identified in macaque monkeys. So if that is the sort of the source of human uniqueness, I, I don't know, uh, because it, Anyway, so uh, it doesn't appear to be a trade-off. There's just, just learning. Um, and well, I want, one thing I did want to, you know, some of the other things on here. So these two systems, these two areas here are referring to what's called the mirror system. This is one that perceives your sort of your body and space, and this is for motor control. And they, they connect to control actions, but they also uh, basically simulate those actions in order to understand what you're seeing somebody else do. Right, so this is a, a, a particular example where both the production and the reproduction, where doing something yourself and learning from somebody else are literally based on the same neural system. And this is actually a really interesting possibility for biocultural feedback here, because you can have certain practices, for instance, in the production of tools, which is what I study in my lab, that are going to indirectly favor more general social learning capabilities because they rely on the same system. So I'm not trying to say that this sort of feedback stuff is, isn't interesting. I, I love it. I think it's very important. I just think that we have to be really careful about it. Um, and cultural evolution and biocultural feedback certainly happen, but they don't always occur, and they don't always happen in the same way. And they shouldn't, they're not necessarily indefinitely self-sustaining when they do occur. Right, so these kind of dynamics are going to depend on a, a wide range of particular conditions that may or may not apply in given cases. Um, so if we ditch the assumption of progress in human evolution, um, then we could equally ask questions about why particular technological systems are so stable um, and why ours are so unstable as sort of asking what's, what was wrong with the Shulian uh, hominids that they couldn't get off this hand axe thing for a million years, right? Which people do quite a lot. I don't like it. Uh, um, so, some, some take home. So, you may have noticed that, with the, the exception of the sort of startup problem, I didn't actually question any specific uh, model um, or result of, uh, of biocultural evolution. And, and my point isn't that any particular work is actually wrong, uh, but rather that we need to be more careful with assumptions and biases uh, and expand our thinking to embrace a wider range of evolutionary processes. Uh, so some of the key takeaways are that we should be very, very cautious about unexamined elision between reproductive fitness, cultural complexity, and some notion of improvement. Um, that human evolution is, is likely much more complex than a single trajectory of sustained autocatalytic feedback. That cultural rep reproduction is more than just information replication. That social and non-social learning are not natural kinds and that proximate mechanisms may be just as important as ultimate causes like selection and drift. So the point of science is to explain things as simply as possible without oversimplifying. And I think the jury is still out exactly how far in the direction of oversimplifying some of this cultural evolutionary uh, stuff goes. But it's something we, we need to be careful about. So thank you very much uh, for your attention.
Thank you very much, Dr. Stout. And my apologies for the slides. I think this set is uh, mostly Mac users. And yeah, so there was a, I know, I'm terrified. Myself included, I didn't even know how to load the slide presentation onto this computer. So my apologies, uh, and to all of you as well for, for that. So um, I can advance the slides though, but barely. All right, so our fourth and final speaker of the session, and in fact, the final speech speaker of the day is Dr. Melinda Zeter. Dr. Zeter is Senior Scientist and Curator Emeritus of Old World Archaeology in the Department of Anthropology of the National Museum of Natural History at Smithsonian Institution. She's a Fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and member of both the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Zeter's research interests include uh, the domestication of plants and animals and the origins of agriculture. She has conducted extensive archaeological field work throughout the Near East, including Iran, Israel, Turkey, and Syria. And in these contexts, she's focused on the, the social and environmental implications of early agriculture in addition to the details of the domestication process itself. She's authored or edited four books, including the hugely influential 1991 titled uh, uh, Feeding Cities, Specialized Animal Economy, um, in the ancient Near East, and she's lead editor uh, of Documenting Domestication, New Genetic and Archaeological Paradigms, published in 2006. She's published scores of book chapters and articles appearing in top journals, including Science, Proceedings at the National Academy of Sciences, Current Anthropology, American Antiquity, and many more. It would be hard to overstate the impact of this work. Just to give a single numerical indication of that impact, her 2008 PNAS article titled Domestication and Early Agriculture in the Mediterranean Basin has been cited over a thousand times. And again, that's just one example. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that several of us on the conference organizing committee wanted to invite Dr. Zeter to speak in our sessions. Um, and maybe I was just quickest on the draw, but Dr. Zeter could easily have spoken on any number uh, in any number of these other sessions. And my eagerness to invite her was based partly on the fact that she has distinguished herself as a leading voice in the application of niche construction theory to archaeological questions. But I'll let her say more about that in just a, uh, just a moment. Uh, lastly, I want to mention that this is something of a homecoming for Dr. Zeter. As many of you know, she received her AB, MA, and PhD here at UMich, and I believe her talk embodies the spirit of this very conference, uh, the past, present, and futureness of it. So as I understand it, she'll give a bit, uh, uh, she'll share a bit about Michigan's past and this museum's unparalleled influence. Her work in highly, uh, her, sorry, her work um, as a highly decorated graduate of this program and active contributor to the literature on domestication and agricultural origins also clearly represents Michigan's present. And her discussion of how and why we as anthropologists should also be contributing to evolutionary biology and not just vice versa, not just consuming their theories, helps to set the agenda for future archaeological research. Her talk today is titled, Why Evolutionary Biology Needs Anthropology, Evaluating Core Assumptions of the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis. And I give over the podium now to... Dr. Zeter. I hope not. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. It's the curse of a last name that begins with Z, is that I'm the last one, but I'm going to try to be lively, and I don't know if I'll be quick, but I'll be lively. So <laughs> we'll see what I can do. Keep you um, from your cocktails and me. But anyway, it's, it's a huge honor to have been asked to be part of this wonderful centennial celebration of the Museum of Anthropology. As Raven uh, mentioned, I'm a, a long ago graduate of the program. I think I'm pushing 40 years now. I hate to tell you, uh, some of you here that were my professors. Um, so I'm not sure whether I was asked here to be a relic of the past. Um, sorry, I, I refuse to do that um, because of what I'm hoping to do in my presentation today is to look to a future. Uh, in which the study of cultural evolution can actually make significant contributions to evolutionary theory in general. Now, as Raven mentioned, anthropology has had a really long history of co-opting concepts from evolutionary biology, beginning oh, at least with the work of Spencer and Morgan, who both drew very heavily from Darwin's work on natural selection and progressive evolution. That's a dirty word these days, and, and, and rightfully so. But it also continues up through the more recent embrace of the modern synthesis of evolutionary theory, which is a blend of neo-Darwinianism and population genetics that was developed in the 1940s, maybe more appropriately called the mid-century modern synthesis, given when it was framed, um, that is actually still the dominant paradigm in evolutionary theory today. Concepts from the modern synthesis 
have uh, served as a foundation for a number of different approaches to understanding cultural evolution. Now recently, there's been a real hot debate in evolutionary biology over the need for revision to account for new insights made in the 70 plus years since the modern synthesis was first proposed. Challenges to the modern synthesis come from a number of different quarters. And these all coalesce together in this book published in 2010, calling for an extended evolutionary synthesis. Now, in many ways, the difference between adherents of the modern synthesis on one hand and those advocating for extension or revision through the extended evolutionary synthesis, it really boils down quite simply to different definitional approaches to evolution itself that these two groups embrace. Uh, advocates for the modern synthesis take a very much a genes eye view of evolution with genes being the source of all variation on which natural selection operates and the single agent basically for the transfer of adaptive traits from one generation to the next. Advocates for revision on the other hand, argue for a broadening of this definition to encompass a much wider array of processes other than and along with genes that they argue have significant influence on the pace and the direction and the impact of evolutionary change. This approach to defining evolution has resulted in a number of core assumptions for the extended evolutionary synthesis that really differ quite sharply from those of standard theory. And they range from uh, the direction of evolution, the targets of selection, the modes of inheritance, the pace and tempo of evolution, the causes of evolutionary change, basically everything we've been talking about this afternoon. The response um, by modern synthesis advocates has basically been prove it. Challenging extended synthesis proponents to show that it's capable of generating truly empirically testable novel predictions about evolution that couldn't be accounted for by the standard theory. This challenge in turn requires that extended synthesis proponents be able to identify model systems that would allow for the evaluation of these predictions. Now, once again, anthropologists have been very quick to incorporate elements of this program, this new program, into their research, ending with this paper here that if you all want to leave now and just read that, it's the unabridged version of this talk. So you could maybe start your cocktails a little early. Um, but here I think we have a, a real chance of departing from the norm and, and from past practice. Here I think anthropology stands a great chance of moving beyond just borrowing ideas from evolutionary biology. Indeed, I think we have a great deal to offer to this ongoing debate in that we can provide a number of empirically grounded model systems that are needed to evaluate the core assumptions of the extended synthesis, some of which are shown here. Now, the domestication of plants and animals is an additional, especially promising, I would argue, ideal model system for the evaluation of issues at the heart of this de debate over the need to modify standard theory. Domestication is, after all, a process of unquestionable impact. It irrevocably affected the evolutionary trajectories of both humans and the plants and animals brought under domestication. Moreover, it's not simply a one-off development, but it's something that arose independently in multiple world areas. But what I think really makes domestication a great candidate for assessing these core issues at the heart of this debate is that it encompasses all of these central issues on which the debate revolves. So what I'd like to do here today is to take a look at each of these five general areas, one by one, contrasting how core assumptions of the extended synthesis differ from those of standard theory, and then to show how domestication offers a potential for exploring each of these areas. Let me see if I'm getting some water. I've developed a terrible cold. I've just been exposed to my two granddaughters that are little disease vectors. And so they transferred it all to me. So I hope I make it through it. It's not COVID. I took two tests today. So I, you're all free from that. Anyway, the first of these core assumptions involve the directionality of evolutionary change. Standard theory, this will look a little familiar to you from last talk. 
Standard theory holds that genetic variation arises through random processes of mutation, gene flow, and recombination, with directionality in evolution solely the result of the action of selection, which sorts amongst these randomly arising variants and selects those that enhance the adaptive fit of an organism with its environment and then eliminates those that make the organism less fit. In contrast, a central principle of the extended synthesis is that variation arises through a number of constructive processes that systematically channel phenotypic variants in a way that guide or bias the direction of evolution. These external or these constructive processes may either operate internally with organisms or externally to it. Um, the extended synthesis also recognizes the process of genetic accommodation by which these variants arising through these various processes become incorporated into the genomic architecture of an organism. All of these processes are central to domestication. The primary external process involved in domestication is, of course, niche construction, the process whereby organisms modify their own and each other's niches in ways that elicit evolutionary responses. Niche construction is also seen as an important source of co-evolutionary interactions between organisms that may take one of two different forms. Diffuse coevolutionary interactions are those in which the impacts of the niche constructing activities of one organism on, on another are mediated either by some change in abiotic conditions or by some in intermediary biota, biota, with the result that the evolutionary impact of these actions are tend to be somewhat unpredictable and maybe slow to manifest themselves. Pairwise interactions, on the other hand, involve the direct reciprocal actions of two niche constructing organisms and tend, therefore, to be the uh, result in much more rapid evolutionary change in both partners. And this is essentially what domestication is, a focused pairwise coevolutionary relationship between a domesticator and a domesticate that arises in the context of niche construction. The domesticator in the relationship engages in various niche constructing activities that increase the supply or predictability of a resource provided by the target species, the domesticate, usually by assuming some level of influence over its growing conditions or its reproduction. The domesticate in the relationship engages in reciprocal niche constructing activities that enhance the benefits it receives from the relationship. And over time, each partner and their descendants make adjustments in their behavior, their physiology, their morphology that enables them to extract more benefits from the relationship and thereby deepen their mutual dependence on it and their commitment to maintaining it. Now, relationships leading to domestication can be initiated by either the domesticator or the domesticate and may take several different pathways. But regardless of who initiates the process, domestication will only ensue if this focused pairwise interaction between domesticator and domesticate is sustained across multiple generations, over which time each partner continues to make adjustments to maintain and deepen the relationship. The primary internal process involved in domestication is developmental plasticity, which can be defined as an organism's ability to alter its own developmental processes and their phenotypic outcomes in response to different environments. These phenotypic accommodations can be made without really any genetic change, but simply by activating dormant variation and include, again, all aspects of the phenotype, so the morphology, the physiology, the behavior. It's thought that unexpressed cryptic allelic variants are especially likely to be activated when organisms are exposed to novel environments, especially anthropogenically and uh, altered environments. This can result in a really rapid release of variation, some of which may be better matched to the environment. Recent research in domestication has really underscored the importance of developmental plasticity in domestication. Dolores Papirno's research um, on teosinte grown under different CO2 conditions is a great example of research on the role of climate in the release of phenotypically plastic traits in emergent domesticates. 
Natalie Mueller's really knockout research on erect knotweed, one of the uh, supposed lost crops of Eastern North America, is a great example of how the niche constructing activities of both humans and a target species cause this release of phenotypically plastic traits in the target species that ha help kickstart the process of uh, domestication. Now, although traits that arise as a result of these constructive processes may persist in populations for generations, more enduring evolutionary impact is only possible if there's some mechanism that can transform these plastic traits into genetically heritable traits, the process that's been labeled genetic accommodation. And this has proven one of the much more controversial elements of the extended synthesis, and yet is central to the contention that the constructive de developmental processes do indeed um, guide evolution. Um, domestication here again may well be a model system for exploring this cornerstone core concept of the extended synthesis. While as I've just said, the introduction of plants and animals into novel anthropogenic environments can have triggered this initial burst in the expression of plastic, um, phenotypically plastic traits, maintaining them in these environments over time buffered them from the selective forces outside of this um, environment, leading, it's been argued, to the fixation of these traits within the genome. Another important factor in the fixation of plastically arising traits, and probably the most important one, is the reproductive isolation of managed populations from free-living ones, especially when this involves the movement of a managed population out of its natural ha habitat and into novel environments. And here, I think, ancient DNA holds the greatest potential for monitoring this process in domestication. Recent work on the ancient DNA of maize, for example, has tracked the progressive loss of nucleotide diversity, the fixation of key domestication genes, along with genetic responses to climatic conditions as maize dispersed out of its heartland of initial domestication, both northward into the American Southwest and southward into South America. Now, another area where the extended synthesis departs from standard theory is in the targets on which selection operates. True to its gene's eye view, the modern synthesis really recognizes the gene as the primary, if not the sole, target of the selection. On the other hand, extended synthesis proponents embrace a multi-level model, as Raven was talking about, in which selection targets a hierarchy of levels. It also recognizes that these multiple levels may be targeted at the same time with different levels functioning in concert. These levels range from the gene to cells and, or to proteins and chemical groups that regulate gene activities to cells and tissues to whole individuals as well as to groups of individuals. Now, there's been a great deal of work um, here with domesticates, again, showing the value of domestication as this model, level, model system. There's been a great deal of work looking at the regulatory mechanisms that control gene expression in crop plants, um, and more recently in certain livestock species, like this chicken here. It's also, there's also very interesting new research on the role of selection operating at the level of neural crest cells in the embryo that are responsible for the manifestation of a number of different traits in domestic animals. Group level selection, as we heard earlier today, has been a particular sticking point for proponents of standard theory as seen by this quote from one of the primary proponents of the modern synthesis, basically saying it doesn't exist. Extended synthesis proponents have been much more welcoming. Did I change that? No. No, well, I did change it. Let me go back. Extended synthesis proponents have been much more welcoming of this idea of group level selection, which contends that an organism can promote the greater good of the group even when doing so is against its own immediate interests. That is, it's capable of showing truly altruistic behavior. And indeed, altruism is a fundamental feature of niche construction, which requires that individuals work together to build and perpetuate altered niches to the benefit of the group as a whole. In doing so, niche construction creates this potential for this classic tragedy of the commons, in which some individuals reap the benefit of these collective activities without actually contributing to them.
Now, one way to overcome these centrifugal tendencies is through kin selection, which is a form of group level selection in which individuals engage in cooperative behaviors that benefit closely related kin. Perpetuating altered niches over multiple generations, moreover, requires that kin selection not only operates to promote the fitness of contemporary kin members, but also that it looks forward to promote the fitness of future generations. The ability to monopolize uh, niches or maybe even por portions of niches. Oh, I'm sorry, this, I skipped ahead. The transgenerational benefits of cooperative niche uh, constructing activities are enhanced by philopatry, which is basically staying put in one place and thereby maintaining a long-term investment in altered niches. And here we get to monopolization. The ability to monopolize at least some portion of a modified niche is also thought to promote uh, these cooperative behaviors. So I think it's likely no accident that initial domestication of plants and animals usually took place in the context of semi to fully sedentary groups that had long-term investments in the exploitation of resources that could be predictably found within well-defined catchment areas. These are just the kind of context in which you would expect to have group level selective pressures um, needed to promote the cooperation that in turn is needed to assure that both partners in the relationship and their as, as descendants continue to engage in and reap the benefits of these collective activities. Now, kin selection and simple reciprocity may work really well in small groups of closely related people, but they can only go so far in fostering the kind of cooperative behaviors that are needed to perpetuate altered niches once the size of the group grows to include more distantly related people, and especially when it, can, it, it includes unrelated individuals. Promoting these behaviors under these circumstances requires mechanisms that shift the emphasis from the individual organism within the group as a target of selection to one that sees groups as organisms that themselves can be targets of selection. In humans, these mechanisms are rooted in systems of shared norms, values, practices, that promote and enforce within group cooperative activities and thereby create a sense of shared identity that differentiates members of the group from members of other potentially competing groups. These mechanisms are thought to have developed very early in humans, but they would have been especially important in the kind of small scale societies involved in initial domestication where these cooperative behaviors are really essential to sustain the multi-generational niche constructing activities that drive the domestication process. Now, another area of major debate centers on modes of inheritance. The modern synthesis recognizes basically only one inheritance system responsible for significant evolutionary change, that is the transmission of genes from one generation to the next. The extended synthesis, on the other hand, recognizes multiple internal and external inheritance systems. In addition to genetic inheritance, internal channels recognized by the extended synthesis include epigenetic inheritance and maternal effects. Now, these internal channels have the greatest level of fidelity in information transfer, especially the kind of template copying system of genetic inheritance, though epigenetic inheritance and maternal effects are also cable, capable of stable transgenerational um, transfer. And there's been a great deal of research on the transmission of epigenetic traits in domesticates, as well as the interesting case of the transfer of whole genomes through the process of hybridization, which is integral to the origin of a number of important crop species. The external channels recognized by the, external, uh, the extended th synthesis, ecological inheritance and social learning, these don't have the same level of information um, transfer fidelity as the internal channels. But they are capable of reaching much broader audiences, much broader range of targets that include, in addition to direct descendants, both kin and non-kin contemporaries and their descendants. The first of these external channels, ecological inheritance, recognizes that the niche alterating activities of organisms leave an ecological imprint that persists beyond the lifetime of the original niche constructing uh, groups thereby bequeathing a legacy of modified selective pressures from one generation to the next, which can have a really profound and very lasting evolutionary impact. In humans, 
The inheritance of these shared niches is accomplished primarily through the transmission of ecological knowledge, knowledge about the environments, the resources that can be found within it, the ways in which humans can manipulate these environments to enhance their returns. And in the small scale societies like those that served as the incubators for initial domestication, traditional ecological knowledge is transmitted through stories and performances, direct demonstration that provide members of these societies with a kind of a cognitive map about how the world works and a platform for further development of ways of living within it. And this form of knowledge highlights the importance of the other major external channel, which is the transmitted, transmission of acquired behaviors through social learning, which we've just heard quite a bit about. Social learning includes a wide range of increasingly more effective strategies that are not confined to humans, but as we're finding increasingly, are widely found throughout the animal kingdom. Humans have built on these strategies in ways that enhance the fidelity of information transfer. This has been accomplished through feedback processes between cognitive capacity, social learning, cultural traditions that have been linked to the development of things like larger brains or maybe just brain changes, language, and teaching, which is thought to be the highest fidelity social learning strategy of all, depending on the teacher, I think, but that's another story. All of which makes possible, as we were just talking about, and with some apologies to Dietrich, cumulative culture which is defined as the progressive incorporation of innovations made by multiple different individuals over varying time intervals into a population's overall skill set or knowledge base, resulting in increasingly complex cultural repertoires. Larger aggregations of people that remain together for longer periods of time are thought to have much greater potential for generating innovations in their, and their widespread transmission to others. So again, in this light, it's easy to see how the small scale communities that gave rise to initial domestication in many world areas served really as these kind of hubs of interaction and innovation that helped propel humans and target species down pathways to domestication. Differences between the modern synthesis and the extended synthesis also pertain to the tempo and pace of evolution, as we heard in Anna's talk. Adherents in the modern synthesis see evolution as proceeding along a gradual step-by-step uh, -step process of microevolutionary change as selection sorts amongst these randomly arising variants. Um, my color selection is much better than that. So I, I, I don't like lavender or lilac and things. It was much stronger, so I apologize again. You guys got to get with the Apple program here. I'm really embarrassed for you all. That's my recommendation for the future. Jesus. Anyway, where was I? Um, I'm going to get thrown out if I continue in this way. Anyway, it, it proceeds along this gradual process as um, selection sorts amongst these variant alleles that arise randomly and sorts out those that best enhance the adaptive fit between an organism and its environment uh, that are then passed down through the somewhat hit or miss process of genetic uh, reproduction to some of their direct descendants, a process that in action looks something like this. Now, while not disavowing the role of microevolutionary change in evolution, in the extended synthesis proponents see evolution as proceeding along an uneven pace in which periods of stasis are interrupted by periods of rapid change that result, result in macroevolutionary breaks that reach far above the level of individual genes, even to that of whole species or groups of species, a process that in action looks more like this. And there's really good reason to believe that the pace of plant and animal domestication was uneven and variable. As I talked about earlier, the introduction of plants and animals into these novel environments, especially those that were deliberately constructed to enhance productivity, can release this burst of previously um, cryptic variation, resulting in rapid population-wide changes, maybe even in a single generation. The human ability to spontaneously invent and then pass on if effective goal-directed behaviors also ratchets up the pace of change in target species. On the other hand, buffering managed plants and animals from selective forces faced outside that relationship with humans may result in periods of relative stasis in their evolutionary trajectory. 
On the human side of the equation, periods of very rapid technological, social, and uh, economic change can be followed as per with periods of relative stasis as people rest a bit and work on then um, adopting and spreading innovations in a process very similar to what Anna was talking about. Finally, talking to causality. Adherents of standard theory hold that natural selection operates as an asymmetrical unidirectional process in which selection serves as the ultimate causal force in evolution. While they may recognize things like niche construction and plasticity, these processes are generally relegated to the status of proximate mechanisms that while they can help understand how evolution works, they don't account for why it proceeds, which is the sole responsibility of natural selection, the ultimate cause of evolution, and thus the proper primary focus of evolutionary science. Extended synthesis takes a very different view of causality, seeing it as Raven was talking about, a reciprocal process in which organisms are both shaped and are shaped by their selective environments. This view then places natural selection on a level playing field with other internal and external developmental processes as evolutionary forces that work together in a complex web of interaction. Causality, as many of you know, has been at the heart of recent debates over the relative merits of various explanatory frameworks for initial domestication, especially neo-Darwinian frameworks, which are grounded in the modern synthesis, versus more recent models that draw more heavily from the extended synthesis. Neo-Darwinian frameworks tend to embrace a view of evolution as this asymmetrical process driven by natural selection, with domestication seen as a response to external pressures, usually that of resource depression, either climatically or anthropogenically driven. Extended synthesis frameworks, on the other hand, put the initiation of domesticatory relationships in the context of relatively stable environments with a diverse array of concentrated resources that both encourage the kind of long-term reciprocal activities that lead to domestication and propel them across the, the finish line to full domestication. And it's possible to generate a set of predictions grounded in these two frameworks as to how the process of, of domestication play out. This is for Allison. You see there are two hypotheses working here at the same time, not just one from last night. These hypotheses, in, in turn, can be tested with a diverse array of archaeological, archaeobiological, genetic, and other empirical data. These data are relatively robust for certain areas of the world, especially the Near East and Eastern North America, but increasingly in China and South America, with the Mesoamerican record still kind of spotty, but promising in other world areas coming online all the time. It is then becoming increasingly, whoops, it is then becoming increasingly possible to build a comparative picture of initial domestication in multiple world areas that is, um, can distinguish fundamental driving forces that are held in common in all areas from those that help shape the trajectory of these developments in unique and divergent, and some might even call them particularistic ways in individual areas, a classic Michigan approach. And I would hold here that it is the particularistic factors that may be the more interesting ones, and the more general ones just may be so general they don't explain a whole lot. So maybe the focus on the particularism may not be such a bad thing. So to wrap up, evolutionary biologists have had a really hard time trying to figure out what to do with humans and especially human cultures in their work. Often they set humans aside altogether, preferring to deal only with natural systems unaffected by the human taint. As one leading proponent of the modern synthesis recently put it, standard theory has always recognized cultural inheritance, but largely ignored it because it was considered taxonomically very restricted. That was emphasis added by I me. Mean, he didn't really say it that way, but that's the way I heard it. <laughs> So la -di da Anthropologists working within this framework have generally followed the lead of their biologist um, colleagues. 
excluding human agency or intentionality from their evolutionarily informed models of culture change. And this discomfort, I think, has led many anthropologists to withdraw altogether from the debate over the relationship between biological and cultural evolution, even to the point of denying that such things as selection or transmission or evolution itself has any relevance to the study of human culture. The extended synthesis brings humans squarely back into the picture by recognizing social learning as a powerful evolutionary force, not only in humans, but in non-human organisms alike. So not a break, but a continuation. At the same time, however, the extended synthesis that's hard to say with a cold, so <laughs> please excuse me, uh, recognizes the confluence of human cognitive abilities, enhanced social learning strategies, and yes, cumulative culture that separate humans from non-human organisms in their ability to control selective environments and shape the course of their own and each other's evolutionary trajectories. In doing so, the extended synthesis builds a bridge between the biological and the social sciences that neither negates nor downplays human culture, nor importantly, does it glorify it as something exceptional that lies outside of nature. Domestication, as I said at the outset, is just one of a number of evolutionary trajectories and transitions in human history that offer this unique opportunity for helping buttress this bridge, though I'm biased, but I would say it's one of the strongest so there's a hint for the future. The benefits to evolutionary biologists of letting anthropologists into the tent are considerable. Humans have used their increasingly effective abilities to manipulate environments in goal-directed ways since the origins of modern humans, if not before, with ever-increasing global reach and impact. It's really impossible to speak of natural systems that haven't been affected to some degree by human activities, not now and not for 100,000 years or more. Incorporating human cognitive abilities and modes of cultural transmission into evolutionary theory promises a much more holistic understanding of evolutionary process and evol ecological relationships in a world in, in which humans have played an increasingly greater role in both. Tapping into this wealth of anthropological knowledge about humans and cultures and their capacity to drive evolutionary change can only improve our collective understanding of how evolution, biological and cultural, has brought us to our present circumstances and maybe how we might navigate a course through an increasingly uncertain future. Thank you. We do have a few moments for q and A. I think I'd like to invite our uh, panelists up to the table, please. So I certainly want to, actually, I'm going to come join you at the table. I don't know if everyone wants to come. But I certainly want to leave room for audience questions, but I want to give first crack to the panelists themselves to ask whether they have uh, thoughts, comments on each other's papers, and so not to put, put too much pressure there. I do also have a question to kind of lead us off, so I will um, sort of put both of these forward at the same time and then let you... Uh, respond as you as you feel um, inclined to do. So in 2008, I think it was, Alex Basudi called for a unified science of cultural evolution. And, and what emerged, or one thing that emerged from this set of talks is that there remains some disagreement in the, the best way to approach cultural evolution. And so we are, we are not currently unified. Would it would it benefit us? You know, would we are we more likely to get invited into the tent, uh, as it were, if we if we unify our thinking um, about cultural evolution, or are we better off ultimately with these varied perspectives? D does it enrich our our overall understanding of cultural evolution? Well, yes. <laughs> um, 
I'm not sure that that, that is such a thing as, as a unified theory, because I think that there's a huge amount of room for divergence. And I think, to actually to answer some of Jerry's qu questions last night, I think this is where anthropology can um, contribute theory. But there's all sorts of different theory that we can contribute to it. And one of the things that I noticed about the movement in cultural evolution is there damn few anthropologists involved in the cultural evolution group. I mean, it was Russell Gray that started, it was a great you know, theoretician and so on, um, and Masudi and, and these others. But we haven't been at the table. In, yeah, I saw a few names of anthropologists on that article, but there, we really haven't been major players in it. And I don't know whether that's part of the evolutionary biology background of not being as welcoming us into the tent, I suspect it's more that we are not put, entering the tent ourselves. And I think we've had a real hard time and real debates within anthropology about, and I referred to this at the, at the end, about whether we should engage in this debate at all. And evolution, because it had this progressive taint to it, became sort of a dirty word. And, and I, I think we should be more bold and to enter into this and to show the diversity of theoretical perspectives about cultural evolution that we as anthropologists can bring that would help uh, the biologists not be thinking so simplistically about human culture and to show them the diversity that could still be then within a theory of cultural evolution. Decades and decades of theory that could be uh, relevant to that, um, and I think you're you're quite right that the reason why uh, a lot of people aren't participating in that debate is that uh, you know the, frankly the the very progressivist uh, approach and history and the, putting the word culture and evolution together is pretty much anathema to to people, um, and there are reasons for that. Uh, they need to be addressed explicitly. I think. I, I would just add that uh, within evolutionary archaeology discussions, the, the range of questions that we can ask have, have grown, and yet we're, I'd say we're less polarized than, than we were. I can have a conversation with Mike O'Brien now, and I couldn't 15 to 20 years ago. Well, he's changed. <laughs> 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 and I, I think that... that um, that's, it's not only the sort of taint of, of evolution and progressivism, but it's also that we've gone through a period, and I mentioned this in the talk as well, uh, because we wanted to be, um, you know, up, up at the big house um, and, and playing with the biologists that we bought into a, um, an approach to studying human cultures that denies the things that are unique about humans. So if you, if you say there's no intentionality and there's no agency and it's all behavior, even you know, human behavioral ecology, uh, where human decision making is ultimately guided by natural selection and intentionality and agency have no role in it, then a lot of anthropologists that know better aren't going to want to buy into an evolutionarily informed model that doesn't have any room for humans within it. Um, so I think we I think we are with people like Mike O'Brien coming to the away from the dark uh, about really coming to terms with recognizing that agency um, of in humans is, is an important element. We'll have a few minutes so we can take some questions from the audience. <laughs> Hi there, Marcus Hamilton, uh, University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, this is great, very interesting. I just have a, a question for the everybody on the panel, including Raven sitting down there. Um, so cultural evolution, historically, 
uh, was essentially the borrowing of population genetics models by Cavalli, Schwartz, and Feldman, and then Boyd and Richardson did the same. And that was really an attempt at using that framework just to flip it over and think, how could we use this culturally and what does it mean? And so that's built in this kind of path dependence about mo uh, of cult modeling culture as genes, really because of, a, uh, because of simplicity. It's, it's easy to do it that way. Um, so when we talk about cultural evolution, there is this tendency that uh, I think Dietrich was pointing out with Leyland and people and Odling Smee to make a direct equivalence between here's genetic pathways, here's the cultural pathways, here's the equivalence between the two. And of course, culture is a non-genetic mechanism. Reproduction, fitness, all these concepts are not translatable and mapping, uh, don't directly map between the two domains. So my question is really, to what extent do you think this uh, genetic view of cultural evolution is really a hindrance um, to how the concept is evolving in itself in anthropology? Yeah, uh, so you mentioned me, so I'll, I'll answer. But, uh, um, I, I think that uh, it is a hindrance for some kinds of uh, questions. It's sort of like it, there's, a, there's a huge debate, as was discussed, uh, about whether an extended evolutionary synthesis is needed for biology, right? And to my mind, uh, you know, a lot of what that boils down to is sort of the scale of questions people are interested in. You know, the more you abstract it to very large scale, long time period, big taxa sorts of questions, the genetic stuff maybe is, is, is sufficient for a lot of questions. And you start zooming in on, you know, why does this bird, you know, flip its head this way in this mating ritual? And you start to need a lot more sort of causal machinery than just the genes to get you to that question. And I think in... Uh, in anthropology and archaeology, we tend to be much more down towards the very particular end of that spectrum and uh, understand why did this particular past society do this, you know. And I, I think that in those cases, it's almost always an oversimplification to use this sort of information replication uh, approach. Uh, but yeah, it may not be the case with all questions. If I can jump in, um, I think that, uh, thank you for your question, Marcus. Very easy question to answer. So um, I think that this really dovetails with what Raven was asking us. And I think that one of the strengths of anthropology is that we have many different ways that we can ask questions. We have a plurality of ideas that we can bring together. Some questions need those fairly simplified models to be able to build on the complexity, to understand things in a, in a different way. And so I think there's a place for them. Um, do, I, do I think that it's constraining, potentially, if you're trying to use that as the only framework that you have? But that's, that's I think, why we have so many different approaches, as, as you do as well, so that we can ask these kinds of questions and we can use those simplified models for certain questions and not for others. I'd also say um, that I think the biologists working and, and people like uh, E.O. Wilson and so on and this, the, uh, uh, the behavioral work that they did really had everything sort of on a, on a gene level, which is something that the extended synthesis people objected to. And yet, true to their background as biologists, so much of the work in um, niche construction work, but also in the extended evolutionary synthesis, is trying to show gene culture uh, interactions, you know, the, the milk tolerance. I'm so tired of milking. Um, but, you know, yams. And, and I mean, they're, they're important examples. And I think there's a lot more gene culture interaction that, in humans than we've acknowledged. And I think it's important to. To, to find it, but that is not the only validation. That the, and, and, and it seems odd to me that it's almost un, undercutting some of the great strengths of what they're talking about in the extended synthesis is the ability to transmit or to, uh, to have uh, 
plastic traits like behaviors, acquired behaviors, be transmitted and replicate throughout societies in a non-genetic way. Now, maybe, it, 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 and, and even to get away from how genes replicate as a way that we describe it, and maybe that there are ways of, of um, describing and understanding how information transfers that the genetic metaphor and basis for our, our discussing it are not really helping. Um, so I, I think that there's, there's a plenty of room to get away from the total genetic dominance of that. And, and in part, that's what our understanding of culture can, can bring to the table. And the fact that most of the people dealing in the cultural evolution sphere are primarily out of biology, maybe holding that back, that's why they really need the anthropology input. Thank you. I was hearing, I think, in Professor Stout's discussion, a great many incongruities between Darwinian principles and culture change. And so I, you know, I'm hearing that, yes, there are many ways to imagine and explain human behavior. Um, but I really wanted to follow the previous uh, gentleman with sort of the inverse of your question, which is, so what are the epistemic uh, advantages of sort of what seems to me to be forcing Darwinian principles of fitness and selection onto culture change, which may have, which operates apparently by completely different principles? Is it more predictive, are problems solved better um, through an evolutionary gaze? You know, I thought you know E.O. Wilson basically concluded that as many of these uh, evolutionary models would have it, you know, almost like like Aristotle, we you know we naturally are what we are. He was looking to a, I think something like a pharmacologically just society to live with as his application the way, with the way things are. So I'm asking, what are the advantages of uh, using a Darwinian approach to explaining culture change? I didn't think any of us would use a Darwinian approach to explain culture change. Um, Well, I'm not a, uh, a formal modeler, um, and uh, I so I'm not really sure the specific uh, like the the use of uh, population genetics, mathematical models to try to understand culture. Uh, I'm not a good advocate uh, for that. Um, I understand that uh, uh, you can. Uh, uh, have some predictive accuracy um, for modeling things like uh, lactose tolerance and so forth. Uh, and you can show that um, if you model it in this way, you have to take uh, 
uh, cultural information replication into account to understand the way in which the genetics are going to change over time, and the model helps you to make that argument. Um, I'm not, I, in my work, try to understand biological evolution, the evolution of the brain and cognition. Um, and so I'm a big fan of the extended evolutionary synthesis, which says take culture uh, and cultural inheritance seriously. Uh, I just think that maybe we should think of culture and cultural inheritance as not just like genes. Yeah, so that's my, my stance. I'm not sure if anybody else on the, on the panel is more familiar with, uh, with formal modeling or population genetical models of uh, culture change that would want to, to speak to that aspect. I think we've gotten into a lot of trouble with, with trying to apply phylogenetic um, models to look at trait differences in culture. And so like the selectivist uh, approach that is firmly rooted in the neo-Darwinianism and, and, um, and in the modern synthesis. And I don't think that those necessarily apply. But I think the point here is, is trying to recognize that cultures both stand apart and yet have a connection to biological evolution. That culture is, is an outgrowth of certain biological forms that through evolution that have happened but that stands apart and moves in and is transmitted and is changes and is motivated uh, in mechanisms and channels that have nothing to do with genes. Um, and this is where things like human agency, intentionality, histor uh, a historical approach to understanding of that has a great deal to offer to balance the, the view that cultures and genes Cultural evolution and biological evolution are two analogous things that proceed along the same, same ways um, that are basically dictated by the way genes work. And I think cultures are transmitted and they work in very different ways, but I don't think that it stands necessarily to always say then that they're two separate and they have nothing to do with one another because I think cultures are very much affecting the way biology and natural systems work as well as natural systems affecting culture. And I think if we maintain the silos between those, we're missing a real opportunity for on the biological side to understand the dynamism of human culture in, in shifting uh, evolutionary trajectories of every living thing on this planet, but at the same time, of also the importance of understanding our interaction, human interaction with the natural world on how our culture is developed. So I don't know if that answers your question. You're certainly looking very skeptical, so I, I think might be hopeless. Well. But the way you want, the way of understanding the world is to do that. Sure is. I, I, I do phylogenetic modeling. And, uh, and, and But it's not in a gene-centered way. It's a way of formalizing and exploring patterns of basically cultural history and learning about the processes by which, the cultural processes, not the genetic processes, by which cultural traditions form and split and splinter and collapse. Hi. Um, so I have a question that I think is probably um, mostly for Dr. Prentice, also probably a bit uh, Dr. Crabtree. And, and if you, anyone has relevant sort of experience, I'm interested to hear that as well. Um, so we've talked um, a bit this weekend about a lot about actually sort of working with local communities, descendant communities, um, and I unfortunately missed the last session, so I don't really know where we left off with those conversations. Um, but um, I was wondering, um, you know, um, specifically agent-based models, but then all kinds of, you know, ways of modeling uh, have quite a reputation for being very, very rationalized, right? Um, and extremely targeted um, and, and very much in service of these really quite like, quote unquote, objective sets of measures and criteria. Um, and so I was just wondering as, 
um, in your work and experience, have you ever been challenged to use those tools um, to kind of mobilize concepts that come, say, from different ontologies, so to speak, um, that came from maybe working with different communities and sort of what, what, what was your experience with that and sort of what were the outcomes of that if it happened and if, it, if you've never been challenged, sort of maybe why you think that could be. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so any kind of formal modeling can be you just sitting at home with your computer or your piece of paper and doing whatever. Um, but a lot of agent-based modeling, other kinds of modeling is really well done if you are working directly with, I'm using the term stakeholders as kind of a, a large word for whichever community you are working with. And that is something that I have done. And what you end up doing when you're developing these models is you talk through all the things that people care about. And the job of the modeler, in my opinion, this is my opinion, right, is to um, try and take all of these ideas and start translating them into something that you can start working on. You can model itself. So in a very different uh, type of work, it's not an agent-based model, but some of the food web models that I do, that is all done with the communities in which I work. Um, so descendant communities in the ancestral Pueblo Southwest area um, with Mardu Aboriginal people in the Western desert of Australia talking about the things that matter and the questions that we can ask and asking some of the big questions, workshopping all of this, and then being able to translate that into code, writing the model and coming back repeatedly to working with the stakeholders. And I think that that iterative process is essential for any kind of social science because the work that we do is always, or it should be always built within that community. And so that's, that's been my experience with doing, you know, very formal computational modeling, but working among communities um, to do that. And there are, there are others in other fields who use this type of modeling, who have, you know, guidebooks essentially for how to do this work well. Um, and I think that a lot of it is just down to conversation, to listening, and to admitting when you're wrong. I'll add, um, and thank you for the question. Um, one of the bugaboos that ha has emerged in discussions among, within and amongst and between indigenous stakeholder groups is the often false assumption that traditional knowledge is static. And traditional knowledge is not static. It has changed and adapted and evolved. and. Uh, and I think part of what we can, I, th I think part of working with stakeholder communities that we, that evolutionary scholars can, one of the things they can bring to the table is thinking out loud about not just the, the state of knowledge, but the history of knowledge. And we can begin to explore that in formal ways as informed by indigenous stakeholders but accompanied by formal modeling as well. I, we are, we're well past time now. Um, and so unless there are like burning questions, I think we should uh, adjourn for the evening. Thank you all very much for um, staying until 7.15 in the evening. Um, and and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you again to our panelists. Could we please do another round of applause?